So why Django REST framework? Well, there are many reasons why you might use or learn Django REST framework. First is the browsable API, which is a huge usability win as developers can interact with the API through a built-in out-of-the-box user interface, which makes the development faster and the debugging easier. Second is the authentication policies, which includes the two packages, the OAuth 1 over HTTP and OAuth 2 protocols. And third is the serialization, which makes it easier to convert data between incompatible type systems. Fourth, it's very customizable and flexible, so no matter how advanced or simple your project, you can achieve it with Django REST framework. And fifth is the extensive documentation and great community where you find all the support you need. And sixth, it's used and trusted by internationally recognized companies including Mozilla, Red Hat, Heroku, and Eventbrite, plus many others. And we mustn't forget that Django REST framework was built on top of Django, which is a very powerful framework that has been in the market for more than 15 years with great documentation and support and huge community. And Having a Django REST framework using Python as a programming language is a great advantage and plus point because Python is one of the most popular programming language at the moment. And it's very powerful which will allow you to do anything on your server side or API server including implementing machine learning models. Hello everyone and welcome to my course. My name is Acer, I'm a self-taught programmer and an electronic systems engineer. With over 7 years of experience, I came to share my knowledge with you. So at the end of this course, you'll be able to build a robust API using Django REST framework. And that will be possible because you will learn and you will be able to handle user authentications like sign up, log in, log out and other functionalities. Plus you'll be able to secure your API using authentication tokens and JSON web tokens and permissions. And you'll be familiar with the Django admin panel which you'll use it to store, delete and edit data in the database. Plus you'll be able to use the serializer to serialize sent and receive data plus handle the nested data and add independent uh, and extra field to your responses. You will also be able to use functional base views and class base views to handle ABI functionalities, URL parameters and data processing. Plus search and filter data inside views using one or more parameter get full control over your API by overriding the actions inside of you like create, update, boot, delete and other actions. Use Django relationships to link models and tables inside your database. And add to that being able to use throttling to control the rate of request to your API improve your API performance with multi-threading and scheduling tasks and at the end being able to deploy your Django REST API online using Heroku and AWS. With that being said, I'm so excited to share this information with you guys and be a helping hand in your journey as a programmer. So see you in the course. Hello everyone, in this tutorial we will be preparing our development environment with all the necessary tools and softwares. So first thing first, we need to install Python because we are going to be using Python as a programming language for the Django REST framework. And to do that we need to go to python.org website, downloads and choose the operating system that we're using. For example, I'm using Windows. You can choose that you're using Mac OS or Linux. 
and then you choose the Python version. The latest one is 3.9.2 at the moment. Uh, we're going to be using 3.7.10, but feel free to use your preferred version. And if you come across any issue with uh, or during uh, the course, please leave it in the comment below and then I'll be happy to help you. After installing the Python, we need to uh, install text editor for our development. And for that, I'm going to use VS Code uh, because it's very, very handy and great software to use for development and with a lot of features and options. So same thing, we need to go to code.visualstudio.com and downloads, then choose the operating system and then install it. The next software that we also will be using for ABI testing is the Postman. Okay, so we need to go to the Postman website, postman.com downloads, download the software and will be good to go. I'm going to leave all these links in the resources of this tutorial. So you can just go there, install them and then uh, get ready for the course. I'm so excited guys to start this course with you. See you in the next one. Hello everyone. In this tutorial or series, we're going to learn how to create an API using Django REST framework. Let's get started. So first thing first, let's try create a folder that will contain all our files. So let's let's name it my API. So I recommend using uh, VS Code uh, as a code editor and it's 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 a really nice software and it's easy to use and will make life easier for you guys. So let's open this file folder I mean with VS Code. So inside VS Code, uh, we can run a terminal. So inside the terminal, we need to create a virtual environment. Virtual environment is very important. Why? Because virtual environment will contain all our packages and frameworks and the, the software that we need okay the packages that we need to build our project without interfering with other projects if we're using different versions or different libraries so in order to install that we need to install virtual environment i had it already installed so but if you guys want to install just go pip install virtual env after installing it we need to create the virtual environment. So how we do that, we just type virtual env and we write the name of virtual environment that we want. You can name it any, any name. I'm going to name it env. So now it's preparing the virtual environment for us. As, as you see, I'm using Python 3.7. I assume that you guys had the Python installed, so I recommend using Python 3.7. 3 uh, so after installing the virtual environment files and, and uh, necessary libraries, we need to activate the virtual environment. So how we activate the virtual environment, dot, dot slash, we go to the directory which is env slash scripts slash activate. So as you see here guys, we have a little env here between two parentheses. So this means that our vir virtual environment is activated and anything we install now will be inside our virtual environment. So first thing first, Django REST framework uh, works inside the Django ver ver environment, which means first we need to install Django. So let's let's do it. Pip install Django. So 
So all our projects, all the the work that we, we, we can do is inside Django. So first thing, we need to install Django. After installing Django, we need to create or start a Django project. So the Django project, uh, inside the Django project, we will build our API. So after in this tutorial, after we install the Django, the Django and start our Django project, we will run this project, run the server, uh, Django server, make sure everything works fine. And in the next tutorial, we will carry on with the uh, rest of uh, uh, ABI building it, you know. So it's installing now. It depends on your internet speed or uh, the time that you know Django takes to get installed. So it's installing now. It won't. It won't take long. So as as we see now, it's already installed. So what we need to do next is start a Django app. So how we do that, we go Django admin start start project and then we name the project that we need to whatever name you want. So let's name it my API because we're gonna build an API. So as we see here this created a Django project with the project files inside. Django created all that for us. So what we need to do next is go inside the directory of the folder, my API, and run the server. So how we run a Django server, we just go Python, manage dot by which is this file that will manage all our most of our operations inside Django uh, run server and this will run a Django server as we see here Django created a, a database file using SQLite SQLite is database where the Django stores uh, tables that that already uh, being created inside Django uh, project so and if we not see it says we have 17 unapplied migrations so unapplied migrations or migrations we will talk about it later but for now all you need to know that migrations um, is related to your database tables. So if you create a new database structure or a new tables, you need to run migration in order for Django to connect the database together and create the necessary files. So in order to do that, Control C to close the server and we need to run the migration. How we run the migration? We just go Python manage dot by migrate. And as we see, we did all the necessary migrations for now. And let's run the server again. As as we and as we see now, there's no that we not we're not getting the same as uh, that we got previously so and it's telling us starting development server at localhost so if we go to this localhost we'll see that our Django server is running successfully so what we need to do next in the next tutorial is uh, create a super user and get access to the Django admin panel so we can see more about Django and work uh, inside the environment and go forward with our 
uh, API building. And thank you guys for your time. Hello everyone. In this tutorial, we will see one of Django features that comes out of the box for us to utilize and use and it's pretty handy and useful when developing our Django projects and it is the admin panel so if you come here if you check last tutorial we created a Django project so if we if we explore the files here we can see that uh, we have like uh, some pre-built files they created when we created uh, the project using the admin or the Django admin comment and inside here if we go to the urls.py file which represents the urls that our project will serve uh, we see here that we already have a URL or a path called admin and in order to see or check that let's first run our server so if we open the terminal inside here before running the server let's first activate the virtual environment so we do it as we do it usually dot then space dot forward slash and then we uh, put the folder of the virtual environment and then script and then activate and after we see this env here we know that our virtual environment is activated now we can run our server so we simply type python manage dot py run server and now the server is running but i have some migrations here telling me you have 18 unapplied migrations so guys if you have or if you see this message here just simply close the, the the server by just control C just pressing control C and then uh, run the migration so how we run the migration first thing first we do Python manage dot pi make migrations yeah I misspelled it and then we migrate so Python manage dot by migrate and as you see here all the migration is getting uh, uh, applied so now we can run the server and if we go to this link here which is the local host we see our server is running what we need to do is we need to navigate to this path here uh, and we'll see what what we'll get so if I go here and type admin it'll ask me to log in to provide username and password at the moment I don't have a username and password for to, to enter this panel here in order to get this we need to create a super user or in other words an administrator in order to do that we come back here to our terminal we close the server and then we type python manage dot pi create super user so that will ask me for username let's name it admin and then email address let's just say admin at myapi.com for example and then we add the password I'm typing the password but it's hidden you won't see it um, on the terminal 
and that's telling me now that super user created successfully so if we run the server again and then go to the admin panel here link and uh, provide the credentials admin and the password as you see now we logged in and this is guys is the admin panel that Django provides and as you see now we only have uh, two options uh, one uses the other one is groups and that's because we don't have any applications yet in our uh, Django projects and each application we we create and always start in our Django project we can add it to the admin panel and that will give us um, uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of testing and and managing our project uh, without having to build an administrator panel where we uh, can insert delete data and all that stuff so if we let's check for example users here if we go to users we can see that I have here the user that I created I can simply add another user here uh, by just typing the name for example user1 and then adding a password here just verifying the password and then save and this user will be saved and it'll take me to another um, interface here where I, can, where I can add more information about the user and some permissions and all that comes out of the box I didn't have to code that I didn't have to configure that all that is ready for me uh, from Django and then I can simply save it and I'll have here a new user okay I can also um, create some groups and add user users to it so for example here if I go add group I can just name for example group one and each group will have like um, some permissions or you know um, some uh, limitations I can specify here and add you know to to the group and I can then add users to that group for example if I choose for for example uh, this one and add it here and then save now I have a group here okay where I can if I go back to users for example user 1 I, you can see here that I can add user 1 to a group 1 for example and then uh, the users that inside this group have certain permissions and limitations so all that I can do from uh, Django uh, admin panel so for this tutorial I just wanted to show you uh, the Django admin panel because we are going to utilize this in the future when we create our apps adding data deleting data and all that stuff and you'll see how easy to use and handy is admin panel so that's it guys for this tutorial hope it was useful if you have any questions please leave them in the comment below and until the next one hello everybody so today we're gonna create or write our first model or uh, data table okay and I was thinking about let's create something that will give us we all love cars so let's let's create something that will store some car specs okay so we open our inside our API or my API app okay we go to models.py uh, and here we start uh, writing uh, the code for our table as a class based model okay so we start by class 
and then the name of the class let's say car uh, specs okay car specs okay and we need to <coughs> We need to import here or inherit some functionality from models dot model, okay, which we uh, we imported here. So after that, we start creating uh, our uh, table fields, okay. So what we need to, what we really need to. Uh, uh, store about our cars okay what specs first let's start by uh, brand okay car brand so car brand brand is the field we need to tell our server or our uh, Django model what type of data is going to be stored here so we start by models dot I think it's gonna be string and it's not gonna be long so the best thing to choose char field this is character field and we need to put some I mean this this takes a lot lots of arguments here but we need what we need to put now which is enough just to put some specification is a max link okay Let's add a max length. So we'll tell um, our table this is the maximum length for this field. Okay. Uh, we're not going to talk about all this here. For example, blank, false, uh, blank, null. <coughs> this will make it's like this. Those are kind of uh, specifications or configurations, restrictions. All of that are here. So like if we choose blank and false if when we store data here or when we send data the, to the table if this field is blank true and null true okay then it will be accepted if it's blank false null false that uh, that will give us an error okay like a server error or no bad request error okay so we're not we're not going to talk about this restrictions at the moment we'll have another tutorial for all that uh, for now let's just do max link and how many characters the brand would be out I, I don't think it's going to be more than uh, 50 so 50 is enough what else we need to add we need to add car model And it's going to be the same chart field. Okay, model can be maybe longer, so we add, we we allocate like hundred characters for it. Uh, what else can we add? Uh, production year maybe okay and this also can be a chart field and can be can be a string okay although it's a year but it's okay and um maybe let's let's take uh, check one side here that are found and see what else can we do about car okay so this car uh, yeah we can write car body type okay let's go here just trying to create some useful fields here ok 
Okay. What else can we add, do you think? Maybe it's enough, but I'd like to add like engine type, for example. This is a cool engine type. So I think that's enough for now. I think those fields will be enough for us, you know, to see how we manage our model, how we store data in it, uh, you know, how we get the data from it. So let's save that. As we know, or as we spoke about in previous tutorials, a model in, in, in a Django application is like a table, okay? Uh, a table means it's a, a database okay that formed or formatted in in a table okay which is, has fields with columns you know like that okay, you can see it like that and after we create any kind of table uh, or database in, in in our models we need to try to do something to um, make our server acknowledge okay or uh, uh, format this database in such a way that uh, will be stored in like an SQL uh, form okay it will be like translated from model okay class based model into uh, a normal database um, uh, like SQL, Postgres SQL, MySQL, or SQL Lite. So normally, what Django uses in the local host is SQL Lite. Okay. So how we do that? Okay. How we store those fields as as a schema or as um, uh, accessible database in our server? So we do that through migration. So after we uh, write our model. And our fields here we create our table we need to run the server and run migrations okay make migrations and then migrate so let's do that now let's open the terminal let's clear this uh, and activate our virtual environment Okay, let's navigate to our application, I mean project folder, and let's run the server and see if, they're gonna, if the server will give us a message telling us that there's some data need to be migrated or something like that. Uh, um, Okay, it didn't give us any any uh, message about the data because it's not a new app. It's within the app that we already created. So we know that after we create any model, now we need to run the migrations. So what we run first is Python manage dot by make migrations and if you look here after we run make migrations our server or Django server create model car specs so after that now we run migrate Okay, so migration has been applied now. So how can we access this? We don't have any view, okay, to deal with with our model that we created, and how are we gonna store data in it and see what's stored there. So before creating a view 
to deal with that. Let's add this table to our admin panel so can so we can access uh, those fields there we can we'll be able to add and delete and see what's in our database as an admin okay so to do that we come to admin.py and here we first thing we import our model so from dot models which is this file here we import car specs which is the model okay and then what we do is we need to <coughs> sorry we need to register this model in our database so what we do is we write admin dot site dot register and what we can register we can register the car specs we save this and we run our server again so let's let's go to our admin panel now okay this is the admin URL and <clears throat> inside the admin panel we need to see something called car specs here we go this is it <clears throat> sorry so this is the car specs if we click here it takes there's there's no data yet okay so there's zero data so we we have here something called add car specs so we can come here click on this and you can you see here can you see guys here we got the fields that we can uh, fill. so let's add some car specs for example let's let's get this this is the the brand we know it's a BMW and it's 740 so the car brand brand is BMW model is BMW 740i production year we can check here 2019 car body the car body is four doors sedan engine type fuel engine okay so what's next what's next now we can save this data if we click save here you will see that we have a new car specs object okay okay what if we need to change this not to show here car specs object because by looking at it like this we don't know what's inside so we can change this from our model by using a a function a result function called string so if we write here we write the string str I mean and we need this function to return this function must must return a string okay so what we need this function to return we need this function to return for example the car brand okay so we know that this car when we look to our uh, database there on the admin panel we know this is a BMW so we just need a right car model or car brand I mean okay we save we wait for the server to rerun and if we go now here and refresh well it says same um, name car brand is not defined okay because this I did a mistake here so in order to access the car brand which is in in the main class 
we need to use self, the reference self. Okay, that's it. We save. Wait for the server to run. Come back here. We refresh. And as you see here, we got BMW. Okay, so let's add another car. We can add as many as we want to now. So, what else do we have? Let's have let's add this Mercedes, for example. So this is the brand. Okay. Uh, and this is the model. Year of production, production I think is 2019 also, and fuel engine, so 2019, uh, fuel engine, I think four door sedan or something else, yeah, it's the same. So we can save, and as you see here, we got another car, which Mercedes, and and if we click here we get to see all the specs and we can delete and or we can edit and save we do whatever we want with it so that's it for now uh, this is for this tutorial guys with the model we learned how to create a model uh, create some fields add it to the database add some data to it through our admin panel so in the next tutorial we're going to create we're going to work with views and we can we can create a view that will deal with it so we can access uh, the data and send and receive and add through our API uh, uh, endpoint URL and, and within our browser. So that's it for this tutorial guys. Thank you so much for your time. Hello everyone. In this tutorial we will see how can we implement Django REST auth in our Django REST framework project in order to handle user registration and authentication tasks. So Django REST auth is very handy and powerful for handling user tasks like registration, activation, um, authentication, login, logout, change password, retrieve user information, edit user or update user information, plus social media authentication because it provides a bunch of endpoints that we can use through our front end to perform all user processes or tasks so let's start by installing uh, the Django REST auth and here is the documentation I'll leave a link in the description it's uh, very easy to read, easy to implement and to use. So let's go to installation and to install it we're going to use pip. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to open the project, the Django project in uh, VS Code and inside here first thing first I'm going to activate the virtual environment so dot space dot uh, forward slash and then the virtual environment folder which is vmv then scripts if you are on mac replace script with bin b i n and uh, forward slash activate and as you see here we have vmv between parentheses with which means our virtual environment is activated now we can install the Django REST auth and after that we need to do the necessary configurations in our settings and urls.py in order to be able to use the Django REST auth. So I'm going to go back to the documentation and inside here the second step is to add the uh, REST Framework Auth token and REST Auth to the installed app. So we're going to do that. And we go to the installed app here, apps, and then we paste 
these two applications and then we save and after that we need to add the endpoint or the main endpoint for the Django REST auth into our URL patterns inside URLs.py so I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go to URLs.py inside here I'm going to add the uh, uh, REST auth so I'm going to convert this into normal path this is a path here and that's it for the URLs I'm going to save it and then I'm going to go back to the documentation and because I installed two new applications here in the installed apps I need to run the migrations so let's do that just typing python manage dot pi migrate and we'll see that uh, three migrations happened the auth token uh, which is we will see what is token uh, in a bit so let's head back to the documentations and see what we need to add after that in order to perform registration like user registration we need to use uh, or to install uh, Django auth okay all auth and uh, after that we need to add some extra application to the installed apps so let's do that we need to install Django all auth first so let's do it pip install Django all auth and let's leave this to install and go back to the documentation we need to add these applications plus the site ID to our settings so I'm gonna just copy them and then go to the settings.py okay and add these apps here and then I'm gonna add down here the site ID site ID equals one and then I'm gonna save it and let's go back to the documentations and see here in order to perform a registration we need to add an endpoint for the rest oath which is rest oath registrations so I'm gonna copy this we already have the rest oath so what we need to do is add the rest oath registration so I'm gonna go back to urls.py and I'm gonna add it below here I'm gonna convert this to path you can keep it as URLs it will work as well I just want to keep things neat here and save it and then and for social authentications like login with Facebook with Twitter or github or other social media platforms we uh, need to install some extra applications here and also add some extra endpoints but we're not going to talk about this in this tutorial we will leave this to future tutorials and in this tutorial we will stick into main Django REST auth uh, registrations and authentications so after doing this I think we are ready to migrate again because we added some extra um, apps and then we will test so let's do that so inside here we'll clear this and then we will run the migrate And it's asking me here uh, says no module rest auth Django and that's because I forgot to add a comma here so I'm gonna add it save and then run the migrate 
and it should work and you see here all migration have been up applied now we can uh, run the server and just try the new endpoints that we added from Django rest oath so I'm just gonna run the server and now that the server is running I'm gonna go to the browser and let's go to the localhost as you see here I have rest oath and rest oath registration so if I go to rest oath As you see, if I go to rest oath, all these endpoints are available for me. And as you see here, we have password reset and what password reset confirm. And we have the login, logout, user and password change and registration. So we need to try first the registration and we use that to sign up a new user into our API. So let's use that. So we're gonna add here registration. And as you see, this will allow me to add a new user here by adding the username, email, password one and password two. And if you look at the documentations and go to API endpoints, as you see here for the if we scroll down to the registrations as you see here it says it's a post request to this endpoint which is rest oath registration and this post request should include a username password one password two an email address password two is a is a confirmed password for the password one. So password one, password two must match. So if we go to the endpoint and we add uh, a username like, for example, Mark, and we'll choose the email address, Mark at, <coughs> sorry, my API. And we'll choose the password, for example, and we confirm the password and then we hit the post button and now the server is processing and it gave me an error saying uh, no connection could be made because the target machine actively refused it don't worry about this error i think this error is we're getting this error because we're performing it from the browser but in a real life scenario, you're going to be performing this from uh, uh, your front end uh, framework and you won't get this error, uh, definitely. So in order to confirm that the registration is done, let's go to the admin panel. So I'm going to go here to the admin and then log in. Admin and then I'll provide the password and if you look to the admin panel now you can see some changes here happening and one of the changes or the new uh, fields that we see here is the tokens and what is that basically tokens are like unique keys that get associated to users when they sign up so when a user signs up or registers in our uh, API, a unique key gets generated and allocated to that user. So we can use this unique key or token to authenticate the user uh, while performing requests to the API. And if we look to users here, we can see that I uh, managed to register a new user with the name Mark and if I click on it, I can add or edit uh, information here about this user. And if I go back to tokens, I can see that I have a token here, a key which is linked to Mark, okay? So 
this is the whole registration process that you need to do in order to register a new user in our API. It's simple and easy to implement. So now that we saw the registration, let's check the other endpoints. So we go back to REST auth. And we go to, for example, login. Okay. So if we do login, we can see that this form here asked me to enter username, which is, for example, Mark that we registered, and I can enter the password. And then I click post. I didn't have to provide the email. So as you see, the API returns the token key after we perform the login. So in your front end, you ask the user, for example, to provide the username password, then you perform a post request to the API and the API returns a key, which is the token key. And then you should save this key in your front end. And whenever this user perform uh, a, a request to the API, you need to implement or include this key in the request header as an authentication header in order to authenticate the user if necessary. And to log out, I can simply um, perform a logout by using the logout endpoint by typing logout here and then uh, perform a request. And as you see here, I have this form. If I perform a post to the logout, you see that I'm logged out now. So as you see, guys, Django REST auth made it very easy for us to handle user registration and authentication um, through our API. And it's also pretty easy to do this through our uh, front end if you're using Angular, React, JS, or normal JavaScript. So if you check the endpoints here, so we use the login, logout, and we use the registrations, um, the registration uh, request. The rest of the requests we're gonna see, uh, or we're gonna try in future tutorials to be able to use all the functionality of Django REST auth and take advantage of it in real applications. So for example, to reset the password, uh, we need to perform a POST request to this endpoint here and provide the email. And then the API will send a link to this email. And the link includes a unique ID and a token within it. And in our front end, we need to configure the, the view or the page to extract the UID and token and then provide a password and then uh, perform a post request to this endpoint. And if we need to change the password, we simply need to perform a post request to this endpoint here, providing the a new password and confirming the new password plus the old password. And for the REST auth user, this will allow us to perform a GET, which is will bring or fetch uh, the data about uh, users or update the data uh, of specific user or even perform a partial update using a patch request to a specific user okay and i'm planning to cover most of this if not all in future tutorials hello everyone so in this tutorial we're gonna create a simple app uh, Django app uh, and this app uh, is going to uh, be handling a response 
uh, for uh, an endpoint that we gonna uh, program or choose. Okay. So first thing first, let's activate the virtual environment. Uh, starting the terminal and uh, after activating the virtual environment let's navigate to our Django project folder which is my API So now, what we need to do is we need to create a new Django app. So we can divide our project into apps in order to make it organized and uh, divide the work or the functionalities uh, of our project between the apps. So how to create a new app? It's, it's simple, just go Python, manage the Py start app and then we choose the name of the app for me I'm gonna say uh, oh let's name it first app so after doing that we notice that here we have a new folder that Django created for us it contains all the files that we need uh, in order to uh, program uh, uh, this app uh, and tell this app what needs to be done Okay, so in our case now we need to, uh, as we're working with API, to make things more neat and organized, I'm going to just create inside this folder, I'm going to create a new folder and name it API. Inside this folder, I'll create two files. One file, first is the URLs file, which is where the endpoints that I need to uh, uh, perform requests on, which is endpoints, I mean URLs, will be uh, written there. And the second file is the view. The views is where I uh, code or I program the app to handle the requests that's uh, coming from that endpoint or URL. So. Let's start first by uh, typing URLs. Goodbye. And the second one is views. Goodbye. Okay, so inside the, uh, the views. So there's many ways to work with views in Django REST fr uh, framework. So according to the documentations, we have views, we have generic views, we have view sets, we have uh, class-based views, we have function-based views. So to make things simple, uh, as our first app, let's start with a function-based function based views. So in the function based views it's an API view and, and it's pretty simple to to program and you know to achieve our our objective uh, uh, as as we need a view to handle a response for the request that we are getting from the uh, URL. So let's just use the function based use. So how are we going to do that? The function based use as a Python programmer basically it uses a function uh, and that function is responsible for handling the, the responses. So let's create a function on our uh, views.py. So the function will be like uh, let's name it uh, first first function 
just to make it simple for now. And this first function is going to take a, a argument which is request. So, and this function will return return a response. So this function will return a response. So in order to get this to work, we have to import two important things. First, we need to import something called API view from the uh, Django or Python decorators. That will tell this function that you are a responsible function or a view function that will be responsible for the uh, responses that will be generated when a request uh, comes from that URL. So let's import that from first framework dot decorator uh, decorators import API view okay and the second thing we need to import from rest framework is the response function which is we use there dot response Basically, that's it. So now we need to tell or add the decorator that we uh, imported there to this, allocated to this function. So simply we use add API view. Okay, let's me, let me check. Yeah, that's it. So That's all we need for now. I mean, we can see more options here, but basically, this is what we need. So what? Um, I think I forgot to put two parentheses in. Yeah. Okay. So that's it for the view. Okay. That's it for the view. Uh, if we go to the documentation, just want to show you something here. There's some more options that we can use. For example. Inside API view decorator, you can tell this function to be or to respond uh, for to respond for get request or post request or put request. For example, if I put here only a get, so this function only will react to a get request, not to a post request. Okay. So this defines whether this function will ex be executed according to what type of request we're getting from that URL that we will be write, writing uh, in a moment. So that's it for now. Let's let's send some message message in our response, like you know. So the message. The message will be the message will be sending is is kind of like a dictionary key value thing so all right message and the the value for it will be we receive. your request for example okay so that's gonna do for the view next step is we need to uh, uh, generate a URL or write a URL that can be uh, that we will use in our browser to <coughs> Sorry to make a request. Okay, so this is all your files file. So inside here, 
the URL will be. What you need to do is you need to uh, write something called URL buttons. So URL buttons will contain uh, as much URLs as we need according to what we need to do with our app or API. So let's first import URL or let's write the URL pattern so for you guys to see. So we can start like this. It's it's a list URL pattern. Well, it's a list, and inside this list we need to define which URL you need we need to use. So the URL will be like first as we're using it now. Next, there's two arguments here. The URL, okay, plus the second argument will be the view that we that that's gonna be handling uh, the request from this URL. So which which is this one that we wrote here? First function. So we need to copy this, put it here. So in order for this to work we need to import URL so we get this from uh, Django uh, from django.conf.urls import URL and from dot views import first function. So we imported the URL, we imported the view. Now that's all that done, we forgot to do one thing. After we start or we create any app, we need to come here to our main project folder settings and add the app that we started or created to the installed app. So how we do that? We just write the name of the app, which is first app as a string. Done. That's that's all. So that Django can recognize that app and serve it. The next thing we need to do is we need to come to URLs here and tell our project or our, our main server that we added a, a, a URL URLs file here and we need to tell this for our project uh, main project uh, or our server to include all the URLs that we added here to the main URL file URLs file so how we do that we just edit here we can write path So after the local host or uh, 127.0.0.1 uh, port 3000 slash what comes next is what we write here. So we can write uh, first app. Okay. Slash this is what comes first. And then we need this to include okay, uh, what's in, in the, our URLs file inside, inside the app that we created. So what, what we write simply include and we navigate to that app which is first we write as a string obviously first app dot it's inside API, sorry, yeah. API uh, dot URLs. So that's it, and we're done here. So the next thing we need to do is we need to migrate and run the server. So let's do that. Right. 
Let's make migration first before because it's a new app. Then make migrations. So it's saying here uh, the include your alconf module where we included this. It doesn't have or does not appear to have any patterns in it. If okay, maybe we misspelled something here. It needs to be URL patterns. Let's try to run again. That's it. So now let's migrate. Okay. Uh, the next step is to, the, uh, to run the server. Let's run the server. So as the server running now, let's test or let's make a request to that URL that we created. So the, our URL starts with first app and after that first. So let's test that in the browser. First app. So we got this error said cannot apply Django model permission or a non ready only a non read only on a view that does not set where set. That means because you remember we set uh, our rest for more permissions we give in our settings we told the rest from framework we told him that and was the permissions just one framework permissions we told him that the permissions that you need to work with is a Django model permissions or none read only and according to that we didn't define here in our API view what the permission that needs to be used okay what permissions are we giving this view because you remember as a security wise any request that goes to the server it needs to be handled okay and, and handled as if it's is it authorized not authorized so that's why you need to define because because we chose here we made the restrictions that the permissions needs to be either Django model permissions or an unread only permissions. We don't have this on our view. So what we can do, we can from REST from framework decorators, we can also import of course permission classes. Okay. And we can define here what what permission this <coughs> this request or uh, this view uh, needs to deal with so for now i just need to tell this view to respond to any any request that comes from uh, uh, through that url so what i need to do is use the permission classes and inside here i need to tell what permissions I'm using. So I want to allow everyone. So for that, I have to use something called allow any. I need to import this in order to use it. Okay, I need to import this in order to use it. So let's import this from Framework dot permissions import allow me. Okay, 
So now any request that gets through this uh, URL will be handled. So let's save this and try it. We go now here and we refresh this page. As you see now, it worked and we got this. We receive your request, which, which we wrote in our uh, API views to, use the, to buy file. So this guy, that's it for this tutorial. Next tutorial, we're gonna just do some more work in our uh, view and see what else can we do or what cool things we can do with it. Thank you guys for your time and until next tutorial. Hello everyone. Uh, today we're gonna talk about how can we send uh, parameters through our uh, endpoints or URL that we created for our application, Django application. Uh, and how we can extract those parameters in our view.py, uh, the function-based view. So first thing first, let's start the terminal and, and run our server. First, we need to activate our virtual environment. Okay, and then navigate to our API folder, and then uh, run the server. Okay, so after we run the server, uh, let's go to the browser and just make a request to To our URL or endpoints, and as expected, we get uh, a response back it says that we received your request, which we programmed here. Okay, what if I want to send some parameters within within this URL? So let's try to type something after the first anything. Just hit enter. You see. Our API will ignore all those characters because for our API that doesn't mean anything. Okay. So how we make this meaningful? It's very simple. We just need to add a question mark here, and that will tell our API that whatever characters after this question mark is part of the dictionary. The dictionary includes a key value uh, parameters, which means you have the key and you have a value for that key. It can have, it could have like one key value, two, three or more, okay? So how are we gonna extract whatever comes after all the parameters that we, we just included here, okay? It's pretty simple if we go back to our view. You see that we we used request here as, a, as an argument in our uh, function-based uh, view. So we can use this request to extract the parameters. How? Let's just simply first print those parameters. Okay, let's go print request. dot query underscore params okay so let's try this for now we save we wait for the server to rerun and then we go to the browser if we do refresh here to create another request in and we check our our print field here or terminal, we can see that we have a query dictionary includes a key, but there is no value. Okay, but at least we managed to get this all these characters in our API or backend. 
So how are we going to put a value here for this characters? Oh, let's, let's use some meaningful characters here. Uh, let's say key, or let's say ID, for example. Sorry. After that, we put equal, and we write, for example, one, two, three, four, three, four, and we hit enter. Now, if we go back and look here, we see that we managed to get or to extract a dictionary with an ID key and a value. Okay, okay, how to get uh, this value from this dictionary? Well, so it's, it's simple. If you just go here, let's do another print statement. And what we need to print is uh, request dot query parents and we tell we tell the what which key which value for, okay we need to print the value for the value for which key okay we just write here or type key okay and then let's save it and try if we can see if we can get that key from from the dictionary so if we run this back again it's giving a, a, an error saying that key is not oh yeah because it's not key okay that's why i wanted to write key but then i change it to id so that's wrong there is no key in the parameters there's id okay so if we save this and we come back here and we do a refresh okay so successful if we go back here and check do you see this number this is the value for the id key so we managed to extract first the parameters as a dictionary and then the values from the exact dictionary okay what if we need to send more than one uh, key value in the dictionary it's simple we just we would need to create a separator okay so if we need to 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 create a separator between uh, or, or i mean if we need to add more than one variable or one more than one key value we need to just separate them okay and then write another key which is for example key equal another value which could be for example km1234 okay let's hit enter and if we go back here if you look here you see that our dictionary dictionary now has an id with the value and also has a key with the value okay and what if we want to print the value the value for the key Okay, we change this to key and that's it if we go now and do another request and come back to our server and check we have the value for the first key the value for another key that's very handy when it comes to for example if you want to send some information with your request to your API like if you want to send some ID and you, in, in your API or server, you want to use that ID to filter some data from your database. And we will see that when we use the uh, uh, class-based functions or view sets. So we can send uh, some values with, within our uh, endpoint or URL, and then we can use it there in in our you know in our server to filter some data from our database fetch some data and send it back okay obviously what if we what if i need to send back those those ids for example or let's say i want to send a number here okay and do some operation in it let's say 12 and send it back okay 
okay let's okay we need to take out the this from here because we removed it okay let's wait for the server to run back okay that's it also you know uh, sending parameters through uh, or within our API uh, endpoint or URL is useful. For example, uh, if we want to send some variables or some uh, values and do some operation in it on, on our API or backend or server and then send the result back, that will be handy. Let's let's do a simple operation. For example, let's give our ID. Uh, okay, let's send a, a value of uh, for example, let's send number 12 uh, to the API and ask our, our API to do some operation on it and send the result back. Okay, so let's send something called, for example, num, you know, the number. Uh, let's go to our API and update the key here to num save. And now let's test okay if I, I send this request I can see now the number 12 is printed here so let's let's ask our server or API to multiply this number by 2 and then send it back how we can do that simply let's assign this value here to a variable copy this Let's say number equal this value, and then let's say new number equal number multiplied by two. How we send it back to to, to, to the browser or to how we add it to, to the response. Let's, as you see, the response is just a dictionary key value. So let's add another key value here. So the key will be result, for example. Okay. And the result is the new number. Okay. Let's try this. Let's save it, wait for the server to run, and then just refresh here to send another request. So why are we supposed to multiply it by two, but we got the result, which is okay, but the result is not correct. So what happened? So what happened is, is that this value that we got from here is not an integer, it's a string. So when we asked our API to multiply it by two, it just added another string or another 12 and put it next to that 12. And that's why we got this 12, 12 here. So what if we want to make it do the real work for us and multiply the numbers? It's easy, we just put int and we include that inside the int function. So now this will be converted to an integer and we will be able to get the right value. Okay, let's save and then go back to our browser and refresh. And here we go, we got the 24. Okay, so there's many, many ways that we can use uh, this trick or this way of sending you know variables through our endpoint or alt or server or api to some operation it send it back and so on so that's it for this tutorial guys thank you so much for your time until the next one hello everybody today we're going to talk about um, permissions and authentications so we know that rest firmware provide us with uh, uh, many methods of authentications and uh, permissions uh, and what we're gonna do now we're gonna 
speak about what we what's the best to use and and how to use it uh, and we we will do that using decorators because now we are using a, a function based uh, view as you remember in the last app we created uh, so guys let's let's check the documentation and and see what options we have uh, on the on the documentations if you go to uh, Django REST framework authentications we can see that first thing first REST frame framework provide us with two default uh, authentication methods first one is basic authentication second one is session authentication so basic authentication is basically when you provide a username password to the server or uh, where, where you you hosting your API and then uh, you the server will check if the password or the, the credentials the password and username are correct then will give a response telling that uh, uh, that this uh, request is authorized uh, uh, and you know will give us like uh, the username for example uh, session authentication is a bit different because session authentication um, actually relies on something called session and session what is session session is when the server uh, creates some kind of data uh, to store some information about the user for example after first login from the user the server will create kind of uh, let's say dictionary or in the JSON uh, format uh, kind of data about the user like uh, an ID it will give the user an ID uh, it will give uh, will tell, maybe it will store some metadata about the user like if it's if the user is admin or a normal user uh, maybe it will store what pages uh, th this user visited or from which page the user uh, made the request it's just kind of uh, tracking uh, uh, users uh, users are in, in the website so what happens is the server will send this after create creating this session data will send it to the to the browser and it will get saved there maybe in the local storage maybe in um, in, in the memory or something like that so if the user comes back uh, the user doesn't need to log in again because the sh the, the, the session uh, data is there so the user can carry on using uh, because this session data uh, has an ID that will be sent back to the, to the server to authenticate so uh, or to tell the, the server that this is the same user that uh, was using this before and some, something like that so but we're not going to be using that actually actually what we're going to be using now is uh, token authentication token authentication is is a secure authentication and is very reliable and, and secure and you know uh, highly recommended and uh, actually most of the APIs use, use uh, um, token authentication especially, especially uh, in the applications where you, you, you use for example a mobile app or you know uh, a desktop or web app and you need to you know uh, authent uh, send requests to, use, to your server API so uh, what we need to use token authentication to use token authentication we need two things first we need to add rest form framework auth token to our installed app which we know where is it if you go to our settings the main project here all our apps added here so to use token authentication we need to add uh, the app here so we can edit here for example maybe we edit here before it doesn't matter but I just keep things you know, a bit organized 
So this frame framework of token must be installed there. And the second thing, as you see in the documentation, we need to define uh, in our, well, maybe it's not here. So if we go here, where the rest framework is that you see here, default authentication classes. We have basic authentication, switch and authentication. I'm gonna comment out those because we're not gonna be using them. And I'm gonna be using the token authentication. So this is what I'm gonna be putting here. It must be a string. So it's a list, it's, it's a list of strings. So uh, it needs to be token authentication. Okay, to make sure we're spelling it right, we need to come here. Yeah, that, that's it, that's it. Token authentication. So after we added that, you see, now we added that the setting we told our rest framework that uh, default authentication classes must be a token authentication and uh, and we installed the rest form framework uh, auth token and installed app. Now, after that, we need to tell um, the rest framework or the API or our server what permissions to use. Because if we chose to use token authentication, we need to tell uh, the server or the API that they must, the permission that we need to use is, is authenticated. So if we go back to the uh, documentation and we go to permissions. So let's see what permissions REST framework can provide, okay? So, first thing first, if you, if you look here, you see here, this is a default permission classes, okay? It says, if we are using a token authentication, so we need to add this to the permissions, it says, is authenticated, okay? Don't worry about this now. So, is authenticated is when you use uh, token authentication, uh, authentication uh, class or authentication method, okay? It requires token, okay? So what about allow any? If you remember, we used allow any in the last tutorial. And wh why we used it is because we needed to make things, make things simple and allow all the requests to that API through that uh, endpoint or URL. What else we have here? We have as admin user. So what that means, that means is if the user is is already a user, is not enough to do that request. It needs to be a registered user plus as an admin user. Okay. Is authenticated or read only? Okay, what that means? That means the user that that's making a request to our API. If it's an uh, authenticated user or authorized user, then it will have access to all the functionality like put, post, and other, get, all of them. But if it's not authenticated, that means we can't give uh, those unsafe permissions where uh, the, the the person who's doing the request can modify our database or can add, delete, we can't do that. We give them a read-only permission, so we give them access to get, you know, or option or, or head or so those simple safe requests. Okay, a Django model permissions or a Django mo model permissions or non-read-only, those are included in the, in the Django framework which we can access them uh, from within an admin panel and choose them um, I will show you that when we run the server okay so we're not going to talk about custom permissions or object permissions at the moment 
So let's 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 give a, give it a shot and and then let's you know add those authentications. So we need to add this as we said to our permission classes. Okay, we need to comment out this because we're not going to be using it now. String as usual. And okay, let's save this. So after I did that, let's take a look to the view. You see here in our view, we said we can, when, when, when we're using a function based uh, uh, view, you can use decorator to define which permissions we need to use. Okay, so I'm going to remove this now. I'll comment out this. Okay. After we did the configuration in our settings for the .py file, now any request we need to make to our API, it needs it needs to be authenticated. Okay, in other words, we need to include a token on or in our request header. If you check the data, uh, the, the documentation here. I want to show you when we're talking about authentication and if we check the token authentication see token authentication is appropriate for client server setups okay such as as, as we said or mobile clients and I'm, I'm, I'm just looking where to show you what they recommend for that, but it doesn't seem to be here. Okay, anyway, I'll show you now when we, when we do it. Uh, so, as I said, any request we do to our server, uh, after we activate the uh, token authentication and is authenticated, it needs to include token. Where we get the token from, you know that, because the last tutorial we spoke about um, or we showed you how we got the token after we added uh, Django REST auth uh, to our uh, project. So let's run the server and see that in, in action. Okay, so first let's activate our virtual environment. Dot slash env scripts activate. After that, let's navigate to our API project. And now we can run the server. Let me get rid of this. So it's giving me an error says application labels are unique duplicate auth token. So maybe I auth token was there and I added it again. Let's see. Yeah, it's already there, so I don't have to add it again. Okay. We save this. Okay, here we go. We have the our server running. Let's go to the website and try to do a request to our first app, which is, uh, let me get the URL right. So it starts with first app, then first. And we'll see what request we will get. So when I I uh, send a request to this URL, I think what I got from the server or from the API 
authentication credential were not provided. What that means? That means I told the server or I told the API to to ask for authentication token. Okay, so I now made a request without providing that. So that's why the server gave me that response. So in order to provide that and see how it was, I'm going to use a very, very handy uh, application called Postman. Uh, Postman is an application uh, that firstly was made to uh, to test APIs. Okay, that's what what the purpose of it, and it's very handy and it's it's very 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 helpful when it comes to testing APIs, sending requests, adding adding credentials or headers or all that so here let's provide the url we can copy the url from here okay and choose what request we need we need a get request okay if we go to headers what we need to add here we need to add a key value called authentication and then we need to add uh, this is the key authentication which we need to use to authenticate type of authentication is token authentication so we need to add the keyword token space then we put the token for the user we can where we can get the token for the user we can get it from our admin if we go to admin so it's my api password okay let's try again uh, I'm not sure if I forgot the password. Maybe I did. No, I didn't. Okay. So as we know, we spoke about first. We have tokens here. Tokens is a unique key that gets generated for or get generated for for each user that gets registered to the to the database. So for this user, this is the token that we token we we need to use. Okay. So we copy this token. And we come to the Postman uh, application. So before we do that, let's try to send a GET request to this URL without adding a token. Okay? If we send sending request, what we're getting here? Invalid token header, no credential provided. Okay? Okay, so no credential provided, we get nothing. Okay, let's provide a credential. Let's, let's provide a token. So, if we add the token here, so now we are telling the server when we send this request that the person who is sending this request is a registered user. user. And now we can try again and see. You see, we got the request. So the server recognized that this user is authenticated, is a registered user, and sent us a request as we coded here in our view. Okay. So basically that's it. Okay, basically that's it. So this will be applied to all the views that we will be uh, writing or coding because basically it's in our application settings okay it's here okay there's two ways to do that either doing it here okay or doing it here in our views so maybe this is the general rule that you need to or authentication class 
that you need to associate to all the user and your users in your in your server but if you need a specific authentication for a specific view in your api or specific specific database you can always use decorators to uh, to modify that for example if i uncomment this okay now the server knows or we told the server that every request must be authenticated as you said but i came here to our view and i told now my server or my api that for this specific uh, view i need all the user to be able to access so now if i go and try do request try to do a request and if i remove I need to remove the token now. Sorry. I removed the token and I sent, I send now, I will send a request. I'll still get the request because this has a high priority. So the, the, our server, our API ignored for this particular view, ignored what we wrote here in our settings and listened only to what we wrote here. Okay, so we made a specific rules for each view we have. Okay, um, and if if we do it the other way around, I mean, if we choose to do it this way if we if I told if I told let's say this will be allow any okay allow any and if I save it that means all the requests to our uh, server or API will be accepted okay no authentication is needed okay if I come here to views and comment this out and save. If I come here, okay, I don't provide any authorization or any token and I send a request, I will get a response from the server because I told the server all the requests are allowed. Okay. Even though I said that on the settings, if I come here and import the permission that says is authenticated and I use this here. Now if we test, let's go to the postman and I send a request. Let's say authentication credentials were not provided, which means I need to provide a token here. And if I go here and provide a token, okay, and let's go get the token. And send. I got the request. So that's it guys for this tutorial. We wanted to just show you how it works or how you can add authentications, uh, add permissions and how can you play with them or can make a specific authentication uh, for your view regardless what you wrote in your settings which means if you have multiple views, multiple applications, you can tell each view to, to or you can associate a different permission class to each view you want, depends or on what you want to do with it. Okay, so that's it guys for this tutorial and until the next one. Thank you. Hello everyone. In this tutorial, we'll be talking about a new way of authenticating our users in our API and normally we used to use something called 
token authentication okay and basically token authentication was a key that the api generates uh when a user registered uh, registers in 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 our api or database okay and basically it is a key um, that's linked to the user's account and whenever this user uh, needs to access some data from the api or post a request uh, uh, the user needs to use this token key okay and this is not the only way to authenticate a user or a request to our api the other way that we, we we need to talk about in this tutorial is the jwt which is json web token and what's what is special about it or why we would need to use jwt basically if we need to reduce the database lookups um, in our API, uh, JWT will be uh, the f our first option because JWT tokens, which are two tokens, an access token and a fresh token, they don't get stored in our database. Basically, when we request a token, the token gets generated and then we can use it to authenticate our user uh, in our API and uh, I think it's it's pretty good way of of uh, uh, of authenticating users especially um, uh, knowing that it's not getting stored in 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 the database which makes it uh, less vulnerable okay there is a downside of that as well which is i'm going to mention at the end of this tutorial but for now let's dive deep and let's see how can we implement um, uh, jwt or json web token and our G uh, rest framework api to do that uh, let's we're going to implement or we're going to use something called uh, JWT um, symbol or what's called symbol JWT and I'll leave a link in the description for the documentation and to get started we need just to pip install it so first let's go to our project and let's open a new terminal and first thing first we need to activate our virtual environment okay so it's in the parent folder let's activate it stripped activate and then let's navigate our project folder and then here we can install uh, the symbol JWT let's copy this paste it here and that's it it's installed so now let's go back to the documentation and see uh, how can we implement um, simple JWT in our project so here it says in our REST framework uh, authentication settings we need to add the JWT authentication so I'm going to copy this and inside here previously we used the token authentication so I'm going to comment this out and then add the REST framework symbol JWT authentication JWT authentication okay one other thing I need to do here, you remember, we left this permissions as allow any because we needed to perform post and get request easily uh, without having to add a token to the header. So now we need to change this to 
is authenticated to be able to test the JWT authentication. Uh, let's save that. And then now we need to add uh, the endpoint of the ABI token or the JWT token to our URL file. And to do that, simply we need to import two classes here, the, the REST framework, framework symbol JWT views. Uh, let's copy that and go to our URLs. And then we'll add the two endpoints, which are these here. I want to add them after the rest of the registration here. Okay, let's delete this. And now, as you see, the first endpoint, it's API token, which is used to generate uh, the token for, for the user. The second one is used to refresh the token because this token is kind of... Uh, temporary or it has a life a short life time which means it gets expired so and that's a, it's a very good thing about it and we might need to generate another one to grant an access for the user to our api so we'll use the token refresh and let's save this and now we, I think that's it. Let's take a look at the, on the documentation. Yeah, that's it. that's all we need for now. And then now we can run our server. Run server. And what we need to do is we need to go and use our. Uh, Post app, which we created in previous tutorials, and then we will use it to test the authentication. So, we'll I'll use Postman to demonstrate the that process. And first thing first, we need to get because get the the, the token or the GWT uh, access token. Because now, if we just go to Posts posts and perform a get request and let's say authentication credential were not provided and how we're gonna fix this we need to authenticate the user to do that we need to perform a post request because API token accept accepts post requests so let's let's perform that And we paste it here. And if we perform a post request, it'll ask us for username and password. And as you remember, when we use the token authentication, we sent a request to the login endpoint and we provided username and password and we got the token uh, back from the from our database in the JWT authentication we provide the username password and we perform a request to the API token and the two tokens which is uh, the access token and the refresh token gets generated they are not stored in the database they just get generated and to achieve that let's go to the body and then add username which is um, my API and password and now that we provided the username and password we will perform the request again, the post request. 
And as you see here, we got back a refresh and access tokens. So in order to perform requests to the API, we need to use the access token. So <clears throat> where to implement this, we need to add it to our uh, to the header of each request. So let's copy this. And now, uh, let me just add the endpoint for the posts. Okay, let's go to get request. And now it's telling me authentication credentials were not provided. So if I go to the header, and normally with token authentication, we add the authentication token and then between two quotes here we add the token key. Now this type of token is called or the JW token is a Barrer token. Okay, so we need to add here Barrer and then space and then paste the token. Okay, and now we can perform the get request. And as you see here we got authenticated and we got all our data back. So basically, if you're gonna check this token, it's not stored in our database. And that's very important if you wanna save or reduce the amount of lockups into your database. The downside for using JWT or JSON Web Token is that it can't be revoked. And it can be revoked, which means once the user or uh, yeah, once the user gets access or gets the talk the access token, you can't revoke this access token. You can't just um, prevent this user from accessing your API. And that's when refresh token comes in place, where you can generate always generate new tokens. For the user so the token gets expired or the access token gets expired and to demonstrate that uh, if let's say the our access token is expired and now let's go to request the posts and then using get request and we have this um, the same access token that we used just now and then let's perform a get request and you see here as you see the response is saying here uh, it's a token class and it's saying the type of the token it's an access token but it's telling me token is invalid or expired and in this case we need to refresh the token or generate another access token uses using uh, uh, the API token refresh endpoint. Okay, and in order to do that, we need to um, add the use. I mean the um, refresh key that we received when we requested um, the JWT tokens. And because I didn't save that, so I need to request another access tokens like this token and we'll do a post request and then we don't need this and let's add the username and password just by checking this here and then perform the API token and as you see here uh, this refresh token, I need to use it in order to refresh the access token or generate another one. Uh, and how to do that, I need just to copy this and add it to uh, the body format. Okay, so I'll add here refresh key and I paste the refresh key here. So now if I want to generate 
another access token because this one gets expired I just need to perform a post request to the API token refresh and I only need to include the refresh uh, key value here and let's do it and as you see now I got back a new access token and if you compare with this one let's compare the end and you see this one ends with WBGE this one ends with UMS0 and now in order to perform any new request I need to use this one because if I use this one the old one to get the posts for example let's get it and try it tells me that that uh, access token is expired so I need to use the new one let's paste it here and then perform another get request and as you see I got all the posts that I previously stored so that's it guys for this tutorial I hope it was useful you learned something new and if you have any question please leave it in the comment below and until the next one hello everyone in this tutorial we will use throttling to determine if a request to our API should be authorized or not which sounds like permissions but using throttling will allow us to control the rate of requests that a client can make to our API and there are many use cases for that and one of them let's say you have an API where you providing a service or uh, some information like like a weather app and you want to limit uh, the amount of requests a user can make per day or per hour or even per minute and you want to give a different uh, restrictions between uh, subscribed users or unsubscribed users or some paid plans or unpaid plans or free plans so that all can be achieved using throttling and it's pretty easy to use guys so to get started or to demonstrate the use of throttling we can use one of our uh, applications that we created previously in this tutorial there's no need to create another app so one of the applications that we created previously was a cars app where it holds some information about specific car so if I go ahead and run the server and please make sure your virtual environment is running so I'm gonna just run the server now and wait for the server to run and after that if I go to the postman and as you remember guys whoever watched that video about uh, the cars app uh, this is the endpoint that we used to or we configured to you access the API so if I perform a get request I'll get the information that's stored in uh, our database or API database so I can perform as many requests as I want okay there's no limit for the amount of requests I can perform so what if I want to throttle that or want to control the amount of requests that a user which is for example now I'm uh, unsigned user or, or unauthenticated user so I need to create a limit for unauthenticated users uh, like maybe they can perform just uh, five uh, requests per hour okay so in order to achieve that I need to add some settings to our project settings.py 
or API settings.py. So if I go back to the code and inside REST framework dictionary, I need to add some configurations here for the throttling. Okay, so we have different type of throttling. So first we need to add what's called the default throttle classes inside the REST framework dictionary. So I'm going to paste that. So what is throttle classes exactly? These are the classes that configure the type of throttling that we're using. For example, first one is an unrate throttle, which is mainly for unauthenticated users. And the second one, which is the user rate throttle, is for authenticated users. The second thing we need to add is the default throttle rates, which determine the amount of requests uh, per specific period of time. So, for example, for an untype, which is unauthenticated users, I'm allowing here two requests per day. And for an authenticated user, I'm allowing four requests per day. Okay. So, let's go ahead and test that and see uh, how throttling is controlling the amount of requests. But before that, I want to disable uh, the caches here and just comment it out and I'll tell you why um, in a minute. So let's save this and then run the server. And wait for the server to run and then we'll go to the postman and perform um, a GET request to the API using the car app uh, endpoint. So I'm going to perform a GET request first. And as you see, I got back a response. And we are performing this GET request as unauthenticated users. So I'm not providing a token authentication yet. It's not ticked. So I'm going to perform another GET request. And as you see, I get response back. And if I perform the third GET request, I'll get back request was throttled. Okay, so the API saw that I'm trying to perform a third uh, GET request to the API and blocked that. So if we now uh, perform a request as authorized or authenticated user, let's try it. So I'm going to perform first request a second request, a third request, a fourth request, and then the fifth request will be throttled. And as you see guys, I was able to control the amount of requests that allowed or authorized uh, in our API. So that's great, but it's a quite general and what if we want to apply throttling to specific parts of our API, like different apps or different applications? Is that possible? Well, yes, it's possible. And for that, we're going to use scoped rate throttle. So if we go here to default throttle classes, let's remove the previous two and add the scoped rate throttle. And after we add this, we need to specify some keys or uh, the names of the scope that we need to use. So I'm going to use one for the cars app and the other one I'm going to use it for the first app. So to do that, I'm just going to add here cars app and underneath I'm going to add first app and I'm gonna leave the uh, the rates as they are and then I'm gonna save the settings and after that I need to go to the cars app view and inside the uh, cars API view I need to define 
the throttle scope so I'm gonna add throttle scope equal and then I'm gonna put here the name of the scope which is cars app and then I'm gonna do the same thing let me save this and do the same thing for the first app inside the views inside the car specs view set I'm gonna add the throttle scope and I'm gonna give it the name uh, first app and save it so now we need to test this by performing requests to the API using the car cars uh, app endpoint which is this one here and see uh, when the throttle will be applied and then after that uh, we will perform a get request for the first app which is this endpoint here and see when the throttle gets applied so according to the settings that we we made here we have two requests per day for the cars app for for the first app so let's see if that's working so I'm gonna perform here uh, for the cars app two requests so I'm gonna perform the first one I got the data back and the second one and the response is still here and then the third one should be throttled and as you see it's throttled so if I go to the first app with the car specs I'll perform a get request so first one was successful the second one was successful the third one and the fourth one and now the fifth one should be throttled so as you see the request was throttled so I was able to control uh, or throttle each application uh, separately which is great one more and very important thing I need to show you guys so if we come here and we close the server and then rerun the server again and then go to the postman and perform um, a request to the API I'll see now I get a response and if I perform another request I get a response it looks like that the throttling has been resetted okay and same thing if I go to the first app uh, endpoint and perform request I get a response and that means if my application or my server restarts uh, for some reason all the throttling configurations or settings get resetted and that's bad the solution for that which is recommended by the Django REST framework documentation is to use caching and that's what I commented out here the cache configurations or settings so there are many ways of of using caching and it's all in the Django documentations you get like uh, memory caching file system caching um, you get database caching etc so I'll leave a link in the des description for the Django documentations about caching and for the purpose of this tutorial I used the file based caching from Django and for the location I specified the location of my project folder and after adding this settings or caching we will see guys that even if I restart the server Django will still remember the throttling data or the rate of requests to our API so I'm gonna save this and then I'm gonna close the server and rerun it 
and now I'm going to go to the postman and here I want to perform first get request and second get request and the third get request should be throttled which is what happened thing same thing goes for the first app so I'm gonna perform here four get requests and now it's throttled now I'm gonna go to the server close it and then run it again and then I will try to perform a get request to the API so if I perform a get request here I'll see it's still getting throttled which means that Django remembered that from this IP address which I forgot to tell you guys throttling uses uh, either the IP address of the client if the client is unauthenticated or the ID of the client if the client is authenticated to create kind of a reference key to this client to know or to to control uh, the amount of requests uh, that this client has made to the API so as you see now after adding the cache Django remembered that this client already requested uh, four requests to the first app so it can't uh, perform any more requests and that's very important uh, in uh, in production and I highly recommend guys that you check the documentation for the Django REST framework throttling which is I'm going to leave a link in, in the description for it and the Django cache documentation uh, I'm also going to leave a link in the description for that hello everybody so today we're going to talk about what we need to make it possible for our front end like a web app or mobile application to communicate with our model that we created uh, send and receive data and, and do other stuff basically we need something called serializers and views you already know what views are because we, we created a view and we managed to do some functionality with it but to do more and be, be more advanced and be able to communicate with our models um, and store data send and receive uh, we need to work with something called serializer okay what is a serializer basically a serializer is a kind of converter okay that convert the complex type of data like like models you know uh, query sets into a, a normal or native python data uh, that can be rendered as JSON or XML which as developer we understand our front end can understand so if our front end needs to to work with uh, like JSON okay we need to work with JSON data because we can uh, understand the the, uh, the data in it okay we don't need that complex uh, type of data so serializer will do all the the hard work behind the scene to you know to make our front end understand the back end to make it easy for for our data okay to uh, to go back and forth you know through uh, our api okay to be stored to be converted okay and much more uh, how to implement that well it's, it's pretty easy because we need to work with something called model serializer okay because we already created a model okay which presented our data okay so the easiest way is to choose a model serializer why we need to choose model serializer because a model serializer will basically um, deal with our model that we already created it will serialize all the data um, that 
uh, well according to the fields that we we already added in our model so there's no much work to do okay so it's easy to achieve because all we need to do in, in, in our serializer or model serializer is to tell it which model that we need to serialize data from and the fields that we need our serializer to handle okay and the serializer will do all that the, we, we will like go look to the model check the fields any operation that we uh, we need to do uh, to the database through that model like sending data receiving data okay um, all the get put post will go through the serializer and the serializer already the, we knows the model and the fields that inside it needs to deal with so that will be easy to achieve and will get our work done so how to implement that so let's go here to our api where we added urls and views we need to add another file here a python file and call it serializer inside this serializer we can add our serializer code so how we do that first let's import the serializer from rest framework Okay, so from REST framework import serializers. Okay, then we need to import the model that we need to serialize data from. So uh, this is the model file here, so we need to import car specs. Okay, so let's do that from first app dot models well I, I did this because it's not in the same uh, directory so I had to go outside of this folder and then get back into to get the models file import car specs so now let's build our serializer it's a class that we need to choose a name for let's name it car specs serializer okay and what we need to inherit is a model serializer as we said so it's from serializers dot model serializer okay what data we need to, to add here or metadata that we need to add here we need to add the model okay that we need our serializer to deal with and so first let's add the model equal car specs and we need to tell the serializer which field uh, it needs to handle from this model so we write fields equal it's a list of string that needs to include all the fields or basically the fields that we need to deal with okay if we go to the model what fields do we have car brand car model production year car body engine type okay so let's write them Car brand, car model, um, production year, and what else? Body type, expectation. and engine type I think that's it let's check double check again engine type car type not body type car body okay 
So that's it, guys. We we wrote our class, serializer class. We told the serializer class that you need to deal with this model, the car specs, and we gave it the fields that needs to be serialized. Okay? So thanks, guys, for your time and until the next tutorial. Hello, everyone. In this tutorial, we will see how can we add extra fields to our API response using the serializer in order to enhance the response and provide more data on the go without the need to store that data. And to demonstrate that, I created a new app I called it Racing. It's a simple app and inside the models.py I create a model that represents the driver and uh, this model has three fields the driver name, the car brand that the driver is driving and the round finishing time and this will represent uh, for example Formula 1 racing where the car needs to finish multiple rounds at a certain time uh, so uh, this uh, model will represent that and I created uh, a serializer also here for that model that will serialize the data from the model plus a model view set in order to uh, process the query from the uh, from the database and plus a urls.py um, to give me an endpoint for the requests that I need to perform. And as you notice here, um, I I didn't put the views URL serializer in an API folder because I've been receiving uh, questions that why we are putting um, these uh, files, the serializers, URLs, and views.py files inside an API folder. Does it have to be this way? So the answer is no, it doesn't have to be inside an API folder. It's just a way of organizing your files. You can put it uh, in the root directory of your application. It doesn't matter. So let's um, run our server and then add some data and see uh, how can we add an extra field to uh, our response. So first thing first, make sure your virtual environment is running in the terminal and then run the migrations. So after you create any application, you need to run the migrations. So first you make migrations and then uh, it will detect if you have a new data. I already did the migration, so that's why it's not detecting anything. And then you run migrate. And then after that, we run the server. Okay, so no migrations here because I already did the migration. Uh, now we just run the server. So python manage.py run server. And then after we run the server, we will go to the admin panel and then there we will just add some data to demonstrate the whole process. So if we go here to drivers and then let's add some data. So let's say the first driver name is Joe and his car is Mercedes and then his he finished the first round or the round uh, in uh, let's say 15 minutes and then we save it and then we add another driver let's say mark and then we uh, his car is bmw and he finished the round is like in 14 minutes let's say these are just examples guys and then we add another driver's name uh, for some Steve and his car is uh, 
um, McLaren and he finished in 10 minutes for example uh, one more let's add one more oh no let's see that that's enough okay so if we uh, open the postman and perform a get request to the URL or the endpoint that represents our application we should get our data from the database and you see here I've got the three drivers with each one's finishing time okay we are representing here for example one round okay in the race so this is a normal response from the from the database uh, telling us the information about each driver okay what if I want to know for example or add to each object of these the best time okay or the best record that a driver did not specifically Joe for example you see here for example Steve did the best record because he finished around on 10 minutes only and I want to show that here with the object uh, or the Joe's object for example or Mark's object that uh, Joe's time was 15 uh, minutes but this wasn't the best record because the best record was uh, achieved by uh, Steve and was 10 uh, minutes so I want to do that or achieve that by adding an extra field to the response inside a serializer so if we go to the serializer.py file in order to add an extra field here first I need to declare a variable as an a serializer uh, method field and I will name it uh, best record for example best record equal and this will be um, a serializer method field so I'll just say serializers dot serializer method field and inside here I want to uh, specify the name of the method that I want to create and it will be a private method so I'll start with underscore and then let's name it get uh, best uh, record for example and down or below this I need to define this method and then uh, this will take self as an argument plus it will take the driver object and this object is the object that's coming from the view okay or the driver object and inside this uh, method uh, because I'm getting the driver object here so I can extract the finishing as you see here the model I can extract the round finishing time from it simply by uh, typing round finishing time equal get attribute and inside here I'll specify the object which is the driver um, object and then the field that I want to get the value for so it's the uh, rounding uh, or round finishing time so by doing that I'll get the round finishing time for each driver okay and now what I'm gonna do I'm gonna compare this finishing time to uh, a best uh, let's say best record or best time and then if it's below the best time I'm going to update the best time if it's not I'm just going to return the best time 
okay so I'm gonna declare here just to make it simple to serve the purpose of this tutorial I'm gonna just declare uh, a variable call it best time and I'm gonna set it to 30 minutes for example and then inside here I'm gonna say if the round finishing time is existed and the round finishing time is smaller than best time then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return okay I'm gonna update first the best time so uh, let me just bring it here so in order to use the global variable inside this method I'm, I'm gonna say global best time and here if the round finishing time is smaller than uh, the best time I'm gonna update the best time so best time equal round finishing time and then I'll return the best time uh, else I'm just going to return the best time which is the previous value of uh, the best time okay so what this will do is we'll check each finishing time for each driver compared to the, the best time uh, that was achieved in that uh, round and then give me back the best time and this will allow me to add best record as an extra field to my serializer so I can simply just say best record and add it here now let's save that and wait for the server to rerun and now if we go to the postman and then perform the get request I can see here that each object came back with an extra field which is the best record so this first one uh, was Joe okay Joe finished the round in 15 minutes so what this function or method in the serializer did is compared this 15 minute to the 30, 30 minutes and then found that 15 minutes is smaller so it returned best record 15 minutes the other driver came and then achieved uh, or finished the round in 14 minutes and then the method did the same and updated the best record and the same thing happened to Steve and let's say that another driver came and completed the round in uh, for example 13 minutes so let me go and add this driver to do it quick I just want to do it in the admin panel so I'm going to come here and add another driver let's for example say Sam and he's driving a Ferrari and then he completed the round in 13 minutes let's save it so if I go here and perform another get request I'll see that even though Sam completed the round in 13 minutes I got here the best record 10 minutes so it's showing me that Sam didn't beat the best record which is 10 minutes so as you see guys we managed to add an extra field do some calculations and provide more data without even the need to store this best record okay and this is very handy in in lots of applications and for the purpose of the video i just made it a uh, symbol just for you guys to see how can we add that obviously here you can add uh, more fields by just declaring another uh, serializer serializer method field 
and then adding another method and then retur returning uh, another value and then just add the, the, the name of the field here. Plus inside, uh, for example, inside uh, the serializer, because you're receiving the object from the view, you can use any field of this object, for example, to perform another query and then return a value uh, and add it as a field to the serializer. And this value here is just, I made it, uh, I declared it as a global variable. It could be, or it should be coming from a database as a best time, but just for, or to make things simple, I just kept it this way. Obviously it's not the best practice. Uh, but hopefully guys you learned something new from this video and hopefully guys you will make use of this in your applications uh, in case you need it and that's it guys for this tutorial I hope it was useful and until the next one hello everyone today we're gonna um, implement or use um, a new class view uh, to and and take advantage of the serializer functionality um, to be able to communicate with our uh, model car specs model which we created and send and receive data and store data in it so let's get started so let's go first to our view.py file and what we need to use is something that REST framework provides, which is view set classes. Okay, so it's view set. It's it's a view. Or it's a, it's a kind of um, it's a class that gives 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 us many many um, ways of dealing with our um, uh, requests. Okay, uh, storing data or communicating with our models. Um, retrieving data, creating uh, data, okay, all that functionality um, can be provided inside, uh, inside, provided inside the view set. Uh, so to use the view set, first we need to import, okay, view set from our REST framework. So from REST framework, import. View sets. Okay. Let's view sets is a, is, a, is a class. Okay, so let's create that class and give it a name. Class. Let's name it car specs. Okay. View set. And this class uh, need to inherit from view sets dot model view okay because we need to deal with model um, which is our table for car specs so we need to uh, inherit from model view sets which gives us functionalities for uh, getting queries uh, data from our model uh, filtering the, the data storing data on our model and all that uh, first thing first in our class of class view we need to tell this class view which serializer it needs to use okay and as you remember from the from the last tutorial we created a car spec serializer okay and this car spec serializer needs to be um, used in our view okay so basically here we need to tell this view to use that class or that serializer by just typing serializer class equal well car spec serializer is not imported so let's import it from serializer.py import car spec serializer okay so just add it here 
So now our uh, view set class knows which serializer it needs to use. Okay. After that, what we need to say, we need to tell the view, we need to write a function and tell this view where to go and pick up data or where to go and store data. So how we do that? We write a function called get query set. And inside this function, okay, um, we need to get, get all the objects from our model. So we need to do that, we need to first import our model. So from first app dot models import car specs. Okay? So here we need to set up a var variable. Okay, let's name it car specs and equal to the car specs model dot objects dot all and by saying that or by writing that we're telling that our view to get all the objects from car specs model that means all the data from it okay and then we simply return the data which is car specs okay so we 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 got the data we returned the data so now what we need to do we need to go and create an endpoint a URL that uh, whenever we 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 um, do a get request on it it will come to this view it will uh, execute this function go get the data from uh, the model and send it back to us okay let's save this and let's go to our URL dot pi okay here there is some changes that we need to do because we're working with view set okay we need to use something called routers so what routers do a router in this or router in this in urls will basically deal in with our endpoints or urls so we don't have to write a url or you know wiring all the type of things like writing the defining that this is a url okay and writing uh, well we'll still need to write the name for it but we need we don't need to specify it as a url okay so the router will do that for us and the router will communicate with the view okay view set and um identify which what kind of request we are, we are doing through this uh, url i mean if you're doing git post your uh, uh, request or any other type of request and we'll we'll deal with the well with the view okay so to use the router basically it makes um, everything run smoothly okay so let's import the the router uh, from rest framework dot routers import uh, I think it's a default router yeah it's default router okay so how to use it we need to create an object called router or, or any name you you choose equal default router and after that we need to register an endpoint in it that's it's instead of doing this we need just to 
register inside this root. So we go router dot register. We open uh, parentheses and we write uh, what's the endpoint uh, will be car specs. This will use it in our URL comma and we need to define here which view the router will go and use. Okay, so to do that we need to import from views import car specs view set. Okay, then we're gonna use it inside router. Okay, so and after that we need to include uh, this router or router.urls in our patterns okay how we do that okay we just we can come here okay there's many ways to do it I'll show you what's in the documentation and uh, what we can do here we can just write a URL for example inside here we put we keep this empty because we need to include okay we import include from uh, Django conf your uh, conf configuration URLs we need to include uh, router dot URLs okay what that does you see remember when we we put in the main urls.py folder we came here and we said for this first app go and include all the urls that it's inside api.urls okay so it's the same method here we're just telling that we're just adding to our urls pattern which is gonna be connected to here to the to the main project URLs that go in inside the router give me all the registered uh, endpoints or URLs there okay and add them to the pattern so let's save that and if we don't have any other URLs like this one which deals with the functional function based um, view we can basically just write here router or include or uh, router URLs as it's in the documentation if we come here see URL patterns equal router dot URLs what that means is we are telling that okay each time our Django project uh, comes to URL.py. Um, it will check for a URL patterns. Okay. So here our URL patterns is this. If we don't have this, we can just basically type here URL patterns equal routers or router dot URLs done we don't need to add this but because previously we had a function based um, uh, view so we can do it this way there's, there's two ways to do it okay so let's save this what we need to do now is we need to try this okay how we gonna try it we need to run the server and go um, make a get request to this uh, specific URL okay so let's open the terminal let's clear this and run our virtual environment activate it and let's navigate to our project folder 
it's my API and let's run the server dot pi run server so we'll wait for it to run so what we got here we got an error saying that cars dash specs cars by cannot assign to a s operator okay uh, this thing is here so we can't use just the minus sign we can use the underscore okay save and wait for the server to run again okay what other errors I'm getting here it's telling me here that router.register missing one required position or positional argument okay okay so what's that positional argument I think I forgot to add something here called uh, or not here when I registered called base name okay this one here okay so we need to add it let's add it it's a kind of identifier for the router to identify each URL so we just keep it Uh, the same name okay and we save it's telling me that it requires a view set which is I I think we're getting this error because of something wrong with the default router oh okay Missing two parentheses here, so I think it will work now. It wasn't seeing it as a function. Uh, so what next? Let's let's go ahead and go to the browser and try it. So if you come here, first thing comes the first app, and then we put the car specs. So this is the complete URL. Okay, first app from here, okay, and then we go inside our application and we add the name that we give to our URL. Uh, what we got here, we got a response which is good, which means our view set is working. So what we're getting here is authentication credential were not provided. Uh, you know what that means that means we didn't provide a token so we don't want to provide a token now so let's change that in in our settings instead of is authenticated let's add allow any so we can test our view you remember last tutorial we added to um, two cars specs there in our model so we're supposed to get them now when we do get requests let's refresh and here you go you can see here we got the first object second object object third object those are information that we added to our database so first car as you remember BMW with all specs, the second car, okay, and the third car. So as you see, guys, we are able now to communicate with our model through uh, this URL and through our view set, okay. And as you see here, I have a form to add to to my database a more more information or more objects okay so I can another car I can add another car let's add let's add another car let's say Ford for example uh, 
Ford F50 2019 uh, let's I don't know what to write here okay let's let's keep it as normal let's 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 say it's four doors but obviously it's it's not a C then okay and engine type uh, Let's keep it fuel engine, okay? And you see this post here. This post is a is sending a post request to our view set through this URL and telling our view set to go and store this information in our database using our model. Okay, so let's hit post as a as 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 you see here, the post sent the new information to our database. And why we, we, we got this only? Because after the post request has been sent there, our view returned uh, the last object we added, which is this object, okay? But if we go, for example, and we run this URL again, sorry, We can see now we have four objects here, including the uh, the last one we added just now. Okay. Um, so that's it for this tutorial, guys. Um, we learned how to use view sets and how to implement the serializer there and add a router to our view, uh, our URLs dot so we can handle our URLs and communicate with uh, our views so thank you guys for your time until the next tutorial hello everybody so today we're gonna see uh, how we can get specific information from our uh, database using view set and the serializer okay as you remember the last tutorial we were able to get using the view set and serializer all the data <coughs> sorry from our that we, we stored in our database or model okay so what if I want to get some specific data what I mean is what if I want to get only the BMW cars okay or the specs for the the, the BMW uh, 740i only okay how can we do that okay so do, to do that we need to rewrite uh, something called uh, view set actions okay and view set actions as we see in the in the documentation of django rest framework for the view set there is there's multiple actions there's list which return all the data that that you have in in your you know in the on the model or database uh, create it's like when you do some when you do a post request to create a new object retrieve okay you use it to we use it to retrieve data from our uh, from our uh, model which we're going to use today to retrieve specific data from our database update is when you do a put request okay so to update some specific data inside um, and destroy to delete uh, virtual update virtual update uh, I'm not sure what's that I'm, I need to check it okay so let's go ahead and and rewrite or overwrite I mean the retrieve function to do uh, or to get some specific data from our model okay let's head back to our views okay so how we overwrite that we need to write diff the name of the action which is retrieve and that this takes some arguments like self request args <coughs> sorry 
and quags. Okay. So in order to get specific data from our database, we need to use something called filter. Okay. So we need to filter the database according to a parameter, okay, or variable. And we need to achieve that by sending this parameter through our URL. I mean, if I come here and I write here uh, the, the basic or the main URL and I write beside to it BMW, I need to be able to get, obviously the server is, is, is off now, it's not on. I need to be able to get only the BMW cars, okay? So how are we going to achieve that? First, let's see how can we get this, okay, characters from our URL, URL inside our view. You remember when we used the, the, the function based view, we used something called request.queryparams uh, to get this, okay? There's a different and easier way here. So we don't have to add a question mark, put the name of the variable, and then put the value of it. Uh, here it's 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 simpler than that. Okay, we need to use the um, argument here quarks to get the parameters from the URL. Okay, so let's assign those parameters to a variable called params called params equal uh, quarks. Okay, and let's print those params to be able to see how, how, in which format we're getting them. And let's return, we have to return something, so let's, let's return an empty response for now. Okay, and let's save that. And go run our server. Okay, how we run the server? Let's clear that. Uh, let's activate our virtual environment. And let's navigate to our project, my API and run the server so after we run the server let's go do a get request in our so now we're getting all the the cars that we have let's add some parameters here also something let's write bmw and we need to see how we can get it in our view okay so it's telling me there's nothing it returned nothing which we asked the the view to do that return nothing let's go check up here if you look here in the terminal you can see that we got something like a dictionary okay it's a dictionary it's telling us oh i received something parameters from the url and the key for that parameter is, is pk and the parameter value is pmw bmw so let's use that how we can get the bmw from this dictionary okay if we do this here we give it the key which is pk and we save okay and let's go do another request here we refresh and we come back we can see this BMW here the BMW here we need we need to use it to filter the database from uh, from our model okay so let's create a variable <coughs> okay called cars here Okay, equal. We need to start with the name of the model that we need to get the data or filter the data from. Okay, what's the name of the model? Is 
car specs okay car specs dot objects dot here we need to use something called filter okay so we do filter we open parentheses and inside filter we need to tell we need to filter according to which field which field in our model if we go here okay we need to filter according to the car brand car model production year can use any field here okay we need to filter according to car brand okay so we come back here we put car brand equal okay uh, the parent okay variable the pk which will return the value uh, this value here as we saw uh, previously so this will give us the objects that's in inside our model filtered by the value that we sent uh, through our URL okay now we need to serialize this data before sending it okay how we do that we just go serializer okay equal our serializer that we defined here which is the car spec serializer okay and inside the serializer we tell it which data data we need to serialize we need to serialize cars okay and if we know that we have uh, multiple cars with the same brand okay like we have many bmws many mercedes we need to add something here uh, many as an argument and equal to true okay That tells the serializer that okay you have many objects for this filtering okay and now we need to return a response which is the serializer okay we got here an a serializer dot data okay so we're returning the data from this uh, serializer so I think that's it guys for now I think we should go in and and try it now okay let's save this file wait for the server to run again and then go to to our uh, browser and refresh this page and see what we get and here we go guys you see you remember first without this without putting a BMW we we got like all the cars that we added to our database including the BMW Mercedes BMW so we have two BMWs here okay and when we wanted to filter okay and added the BMW to our endpoint of us we got back only the bmw cars okay so what if i want another car for example let's get the ford okay so i just want to make sure i spell it right okay ford and i got back the ford okay the same thing guys the same method you can use to filter by model for example if you want to get car model okay uh, by production year okay by car body it's like you're filtering uh, all your database and picking up the specific detail uh, that you're looking for uh, and this is a common thing if you see if you go to car sites they give you an option or to pick up by year by model 
by engine type okay all that so you can filter through their database and see which cars are available for you okay or sometimes per price okay so that's it guys for this tutorial and thank you for your time hello everyone today we are gonna talk about um, how to filter data from our database or models using more than one parameter so in the last tutorial we spoke about how we can uh, filter data from our uh, model using parameter uh, that we we send through uh, our uh, URL okay so what if we need to filter by more than or using more than one parameter okay how to do that so first thing first if we go to our view views.py we can see that we uh, managed to get the parameter through the quarks and then uh, we we managed to read the parameter and use it to filter by car brand okay so if we run the server now new terminal let's activate our virtual environment Uh, we navigate to our virtual environment folder scripts activate I just want to run the server and uh, do a get request to the URL that we uh, uh, we used last tutorial so you all guys know be uh, on the same page uh, Let's run the server or let's navigate to our folder first. Okay, then on the server. If we go now to the to the browser and if we run as you see here we we uh, send a get request uh, by writing here or giving a pmw as a parameter we get back the objects or the data that's uh, where the brand is pmw okay because if we don't send the parameter and we we perform a get request to this url we get all the data that we had or we stored uh, in, in in our model or database okay so we needed pmw okay so we write here pmw and then we get only the pmw uh, cars okay what if we i need to, to go forward and i mean filter using the brand and the model Okay, I don't want to get all the BMW cars. I want to get the BMW cars plus from the BMW cars I want to get the 740i model. So how can we do that? Okay. Let's head back to views.py. So here we need to read okay more parameters that comes or that come from uh, or URL so I want to be able to add something like this here for example PMW okay dash what's the what's the, what's the uh, the model BMW uh, 400 or oh, 740i okay I want to be able to do that okay and if I hit enter or if I do a get request uh, to this URL it must give me back uh, this object only okay so it's gonna be the same um, strategy that we used to deal with one parameter but we need to split okay what we have here into two parameters and then filter uh, 
the model okay so how we're we gonna do that before we we go to to filtering I just wanna uh, uh, say something about about what we have here okay you see here for example we have a space between PMW and 740i okay because this is how we stored the model in in our or the 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 car model in our uh, data model so in the urls we're not allowed to use space okay all the url must be uh, coded as an ascii code okay so in order to to perform or to tell the server that this is a space we need to use an ascii code there to present the space and that code is the percentage sign 20 okay so this represents a space so if now if I hit enter to perform a git request to our API I get nothing okay but if I look here on the server side what can I see I can see that I received a parameter the parameter is pmw dash pmw 740i so how can we use this to filter we need to come here and split this 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 parameter how we can do that okay let's let's use a variable called params list okay equal and this is going to split the parameters the, the parameter that we receive you, uh, uh, splitting it i mean we can, we use dash as a separator between the two parameters okay so we need to tell uh, we need to split this into pmw and pmw 740i okay so how we we achieve that we we go we do this we do parameters or params And use the key pk which is the whole parameter of what we received from the url url dot split and we need to split using the dash sign okay what this will do is will give me back a list okay of two um, we can say items or two values the first value value will be BMW the second value will be BMW 740i okay now I can use the params list to filter here okay so how we do that let's remove params uh, uh, PK and then we use params list 0 which is the first bmw okay the first value of the list and then we just put comma what's the next uh, field that i need to filter okay let's get it from here so the next field is car model okay i need to use a car model so i come here put car model equal params list and we need to use the second value okay so you know that list indexed index start indexing from zero so this zero is the first value of the list this is the second value of the list okay let's save that and let's try it now okay so if I come here PMW dash BMW we use the space as percentage 20 and it's 740i okay if I hit enter now what I get I get only 
the 740i model okay so in this case we filtered uh, uh, by uh, car brand and model okay so this is we, we, we achieved the filtering using two parameters. Can we do that using three parameters? Well, obviously we can do that using the same strategy as well. Okay, we need to read, for example, let's, let's say we, we need to use a production year. Okay, we can also add here dash 2019, for example. Okay, this is the production, production year and uh, we go to our views the pie okay okay so our balance list will include the the brand the model and the production year okay what we need to do after that is add a comma here add production year okay equal balance list with the key to so to to get the third value of the list okay I want you guys to try that and uh, see if it works. Um, and if you have any question, leave it down, uh, leave it down in the comments. Uh, and if you have any problems, just report, guys, and I'll be there to reply to your comments and help. Okay, that's it for this tutorial, guys. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about API view. And uh, previously, we, in the previous tutorials, we've been using a um, view set from you. Views is a class-based uh, view uh, model. So in this tutorial, we, we are going to talk about an ABI view, which is another class-based uh, view that we can use with Django REST framework. Uh, the thing is, in the API view, is a more basic type of view, of view, which means we have to handle a lot of things ourselves. So, if you remember when we uh, started our first app about cars and we created the API serializer and URLs and views, and in our views we uh, we use the model view set from view sets. Uh, and in this model, only by doing few line of course, we've been able to uh, make a GET request and get our data back. Uh, and in in our URLs, we use some kind of router in order to uh, handle our endpoint, which made it easy for us to you know just edit add our endpoint names to the router and then include it here. In the API or API view, we we kind of uh, uh, need to do more in order to get things work. Like we can't just uh, create our um, view set like like here and and that's just a query set and expecting expect expect the the view to give us some data. No, we have to create or we have to handle all the uh, requests ourselves like get, post, um, put and delete. Okay, uh, and uh, to do that, I'm going to show you in this tutorial how we can do a get and uh, maybe post uh, request. We'll see, and we'll see how we can handle it and how we uh, add the URLs. Okay, or the endpoints. Okay, so to do that, I created. Uh, a new app which is I named it cars just to make things neat because we previously worked on this first app so in cars we just created uh, a new table or model with the same fields I'm sure you're familiar with this whoever was watching the previous tutorials it's just about car brand model and you know production year and car body engine type and then I created the API folder with the serializer URLs and views. Okay. So first, let's add. Let's start by adding the serializer, which is going to be the same as uh, the one we used in the first app 
I think I can just copy it and paste it. Okay. Uh, this first app API serializer because we have the same field so just we have different um, I mean different models so I can I'm sure I can use it uh, car serializer okay uh, I just need to change the name and I need to uh, import the uh, model cars dot models import cars cars is, is the name of the models here okay on the model sorry and here let's change it to car serializer for example and it's gonna inherit from the serializer model serializer and we change this to cars and I didn't add a car plan just to make things simple uh, if you look here in the model I don't have the car plan here so I deleted it and let's delete the depth okay uh, I'll put a link um, in the description for the previous tutorial about the how the the model view set okay that we used to create our API uh, but for now we need to work with the API view okay and next what's next next let's come to the view okay inside of our view first let's uh, let's import uh, the API view from REST framework uh, dot views okay so from REST framework dot views import API view which we can use and let's import the serializer so from serializer import and we named uh, named it car serializer and what else we need to import um, permissions and authentications okay we'll see if we need them later but for now this is what we need and let's create our view class by typing class and let's name it car cars uh, okay API view for example and this will take an API view as an argument and inside here we can put the serializer class which is car serializer and down here we can create our query set for example um, this method get sorry get query set uh, and this will get us all the objects take self as argument and inside here let's create an instance of our object so car equal oh. here we need to import our model so from uh, cars dot models import cars okay this is the model so here we just need to get all the objects from the model so we say or we write cars dot object uh, objects dot all and then we return uh, car or cars let's name it so we can use this function later instead of doing you know cars or object at all each time we need to do a get you know it's just 
helps. And so if you remember, this was enough uh, when we used uh, the view set, okay, or the model view set. This was enough for us to get data from our um, from our model or from our table database. So we will see now, we will add the URLs and we will test and we'll see if this won't get us anything. So if we go to URLs, urls.py, uh, okay, this is just, I'll show you something. See here, for example, when we used the model view set or the view set itself. So here we just created a router and we added our um, endpoints here we told them the endpoints which view is responsible for each endpoint and then according to that we just you know then after that edit included our router here so we can't do that with the API view in the API view we need to hard code our URLs okay so we need to take a URL pattern okay let me just copy this and inside here we we need to just hard code our the URLs that we need to to use. For example, let me uh, name this uh, cars. For example, and after that we need to tell this URL which view uh, is responsible for handling the requests that come through this endpoint. So let me here import from dot use Im import um, what we name it car api view okay so i need to tell here that this is uh, the view that's responsible for this endpoint and i must add as view otherwise i'm gonna get an error okay so it's almost we deal with it as a functional based uh, views. Uh, let's save this, okay? And okay, let's go ahead and and run the server. Okay, let me clear that, and okay, let's activate the virtual environment first. scripts whoever using Mac instead of you can use the same uh, comment here but instead of using scripts you use uh, bin like this okay activate and let's clear that and then let's navigate to our project folder is my API and then let's run the server and let's wait for the server. yeah so we have the server running now so and the next step here we need to include this URL files here or file inside our main project file which is here this is what I did here uh, so this this will tell our project that we have an app with the URLs file include all the endpoints there in the main URLs, uh, URLs file so this is the directory cars API URLs okay so now, if I need to access this, this I need to type cars app slash whatever URLs or endpoints we have here. Okay, so let's compare between the two. Okay, so here, if I go, this is uh, from the car specs. Okay, so if you see, uh, what I what I got here is or all the data that I had in our uh, car specs model, okay, that we added previously. But if we look to our view, 
views.py and first app. You see this, we have only get query set. So who handled um, uh, the serialization, who handled the get request, who handled all that? The model view set or the view set itself handled all the, the, uh, the, the, the requests that we sent through our uh, endpoint, okay, or through this endpoint. And if I type one here, for example, I, I get back this exact uh, object with the ID one, okay? But if I go to, for example, the cars URL, okay, which is, as we saw, cars app slash cars, okay, and I hit enter. I get nothing, which is, it says method get not a lot, okay? So that tells us that view set is a kind of higher level, which um, everything is, most of the things that are, are handled for us. If we, if we need to have more control in the view set, uh, we have to override the, the actions inside it so we can have more control as we did in previous uh, tutorials. In the API view, we have to handle everything ourselves, okay? So, to handle a basic get request here, we need to add a method here, define a method, which is get, and this method will take uh, arguments like self, request, uh, arms, and uh, quarks. Okay. So in this method, or oh, this method will get triggered when we uh, perform a get request. Okay. So what we need here to do is we need when when the client or when we perform a get request to the endpoint, we need to get all objects and send them back. Okay. So how we do that? Basically, we can use this. Uh, query sets so we can say cars equal self dot get uh, query set uh, set yeah and um, let me do this get query set and then after that we need to serialize this data so we type uh, serializer for example you can type anything but I'm choosing serializer just you know because we are serializing the data and we need to use the cars serializer and pass the objects to it and here in our case is cars and then we have to add many equal to okay after that we need to perform a response or return a response response and this will take the serializer dot data okay I need to import the response just want to remember okay so here you can import it here from rest framework dot response import response okay so let's save that actually and wait for it to rerun and let's go perform the same requests again so i just want to refresh this and as you see we've got uh, the data from our uh, api i added this previously 
to the API from uh, the admin panel. Okay. So how I managed to do that, I just in the cars uh, app, I added the cars model to the admin panel and we did this previously, I just want to show you again. Uh, so if we go here to our admin panel, okay, admin. So I added, uh, I went here to cars app and then inside here I added the car, uh, the cars object, okay. So as you see now, we managed to get uh, uh, this object from the, from our API. Okay, so if I need to, if I do here, you see here when we came, we did. Uh, okay, here when we did uh, the car specs slash one to get specific object with the ID one, we managed to get it back. But if I come here and I do slash one. Okay, I don't get anything back. I didn't get anything back actually. It just got me back the same or the last object or the object itself. So it didn't see this. It didn't see it, which means we have to handle it ourselves. Okay, uh, if we need to get a specific um, ID uh, or specific object with a with specific ID. Uh, so let's try now and add or oh, and do um, a post request. So I can't do a post request from the from our browser. We need to use Postman. Okay, I'm going to open Postman. Uh, let's wait for it to open. I'm going to try to do a post request and see what I get back from uh, our API view. So this is the post request here. Uh, I mean postman. I see I have here the same URL that we're using here. And if I do a get request okay I get this pack okay so let's try post request to cars and if I do now post request well I have here in the body I have already added some data here and let's try to do post request and says method post not a lot so it's not handled until I handled it, handle it myself. So I need to come here to use it. In order to do post request, we need to, to add another method named post. Okay, and inside this method, we'll add the same arguments that we previously added there. Okay. And then here we need to get the data from our requests. Okay, so we did this previously when we override the create function uh, in uh, in our view set. Okay, so I'm just gonna go there and grab whatever we added there and add it here. So it's the same way we're gonna do it the same way. Just there's a a small difference here that we this needs to be post it can't be create okay so if we go to the first head to the views the pi I just instead of typing this again I just want to copy it just, you know to save time so inside here let me paste this here Okay, comment out. 
so because here we don't have the car plan so I'm going to delete it so what's this basically here when we do a post request inside the request here this argument it's it contains the information about the request that we received the data that's inside type of request all that okay so no, no this is the way how we get uh, our data from the request from the post request so the fields that we we sent so inside here we're creating uh, a new car object okay so here we change this to cars because we're using the cars model okay and object create and then we pass here the fields okay the car brand the car model and because we our data that we receive um, from our request is dictionary so we can access it uh, by uh, and, uh, adding the car data with the key to get the value okay and then we save and then we serialize the data just to send it back um, to our client okay so if we save this uh, I will leave the link in the description for the video when where we uh, override the create function or view set and explained how we did it and how we performed the, the post request so now if I go to the browser okay you will see the difference if I come here to the browser and if I refresh this page as you see now it detects that now our post or create function is available so that's why I added those fields here so I can add uh, a new data for example uh, to uh, to my database okay so let's fill some data for example and post and see we got our data back okay and okay so one thing I need to just mention here that you see here if I, I put one here after it I get the same result because in order to handle this one after uh, the cars we need to do it manually okay otherwise anything that comes after this whatever I put there after this it won't be handled okay and we will talk about this in future tutorials but for now this is it guys and hopefully you uh, understood the idea behind or how to use um, API views so that's it guys for this tutorial and I hope you enjoyed it and if you have any questions let's leave it in the comment below and uh, thank you so much for your time hello everyone in this tutorial we are going to see how we can get a specific object from our database using API view okay in the last tutorial we managed to perform a get and post request to our database using the API view and in, in, in getting the, the, the data from our database, we managed to get uh, all the objects that we previously stored in the database using the post request. But we couldn't uh, get a specific object. Okay, so uh, in this tutorial, we will see how we can get that specific object using. Uh, the object ID okay so first thing first let's uh, run the server by first activating the virtual environment
and now we navigate to our um, project and let's run the server okay so after the server runs we'll go to the to the browser and put the link here for our cars app which is cars dash app slash cars and as we see we can get the two objects that we previously stored in the database but what if we want to get one specific object for example the first object using its ID if I put one as we used to do when we use uh, the model view set it doesn't work so what's the the way or what is the uh, the technique that we can use to get a specific uh, object from our database so in order to do that we need to add some code to our uh, get method inside uh, our API or uh, API view class and the code that we we must add must handle the parameter that we uh, add after the the main URL which is the ID at this moment our view doesn't see anything that we put after the main uh, URL okay so let's first get the parameter let's see how can we get this parameter that's uh, that comes after the the main URL and then we see how we can perform um, a get object from our uh, model or database so in order to do that let's go back to our get method and to get the, the parameters when, within the URL we need to use the request argument okay so we can start by uh, making a variable which uh, let's see declaring the ID because we need to use the ID equal request dot query param which refers to parameters and this is kind of a dictionary so we need to pass the key to the value that we add in our URL okay so it's gonna be an ID and let's print that first so we can see first what we are doing okay uh, let's save and wait for the server to rerun okay so now if we do a refresh here and okay as you see we get an error saying basically that it can't recognize an ID because when we wrote this code here the get method is looking now uh, or the query parents is looking now for um, a value with the, with the i with the key this ID okay but it doesn't find it so how are we gonna do that or how are we gonna fix this problem in order to fix this problem we need to modify the parameters that we adding to our URL so we can't just add any number or in any variable there what we can do is we can add a key value pair okay like ID equal one for example okay and then perform uh, the get request but we're still getting error because in order for our view to recognize that this is what we are adding after the main URL is a parameter we need to add a question mark okay so after we add a question mark question mark 
we perform a request and as we see if we go back to the to our console here or terminal we see that we have number one which is the value of the ID that we added here okay so now that we can get uh, or read the parameter from the from the URL we can basically come here and just perform a request to our database saying car equal objects I mean cars first dot objects dot get and then we add ID equals ID because we are using the ID to get the object okay so we need to do uh, uh, some modification here to this code be to get it to work you know in both cases when we request uh, all the objects okay and uh, also when we request one object so in order to do that we need to add an f statement here saying if id is not none which means if there's an id in our url an id parameter then we need to perform or we need to get the object that's related to that id and then after that we can serialize it let me copy this from here And we mustn't forget to delete many uh, because we know now that we're getting one object only. So one object, so we don't need many. So else, if ID is none or we were not requesting any specific object, we need our get method to perform as usual. Okay, get us all the information or all the object. So if we save this, and wait for the server to rerun and now go to the browser and perform a get request as you see here we get only the object with the ID number one and then if we edit this we put two we get the second object that's great but we have a problem here if we Go back or delete the ID and and we want to get all the object as we see here we get an error and that's because it's trying to read the ID key okay and it couldn't find it in the URL so in order to fix this we can simply add a try here Okay, I'll use try except and in this case and by, add, by adding try except uh, we solve the problem because if there is no ID or there's no parameter then <coughs> uh, the get will jump directly to this part and then get us all the objects that we need and okay let's save it and see okay if we go to the browser now and refresh and as you see we get uh, all the objects that we have and then if we perform uh, a get specific object then we get it back and that's it guys for this tutorial i hope it was useful if you have any question please leave it in the comment below and thank you for your time hello everybody today we are going to talk about how to override the create action inside our uh, django rest framework view set okay so what's what's the create function what it does okay the create fun fun uh, function or action is the action that our uh, Django REST framework perform 
when we do a POST request to our API in order to create an, an object uh, of the new data that, that we sent and, and save it. Okay, so how we override um, and take control over that. Okay, so basically, let's start by adding a function called create. Okay, and then fu this function takes the same argument arguments that retrieve takes. Okay, so we can just copy paste here. Okay, next thing we need to get the data from our uh, post request. So how we get that? In order to get that we need to use the request. Okay, argument. So let's get a new variable. Let's say name it for example car data equal request dot data. Okay, that car data will include uh, the data that comes from uh, the post. Okay, the post request. After that, we need to create an object of the data that we receive from uh, from our post request. So let's name the variable or the new object new car, and it's equal because we need to. Uh, uh, create an object of car specs so we need to use the car specs model okay which we uh, imported here so let's write car specs dot objects dot create and then uh, we need to add the values you know that we receive our rest Django REST framework receives the data as a key value pairs. So here inside this function here, <clears throat> we need to add the values for the fields inside our model. So we start by typing the name of the field, then the value from our uh, uh, request. Okay, so let's go back to our model. So start by one by one okay so first it's a car <coughs> sorry car brand so we'll add the car brand is equal to car data okay and the key for this car brand okay because when we send it we'll send it with that key the next one is the car model Okay, so we run the same thing car model equal car data the key car model same thing for production year okay Same key and after that I think car body and engine type. Okay, so I'll we'll add them here. Car data. And then the last one is the engine type. The same thing, we add the value, I mean the key. I hope I didn't misspell any of these, but we will see in the minutes in a minute. So after we did that, uh, this is the new car object. We need to save it, okay? So we do new car dot save. Now what we need to do is we need to send back um, a response uh, to our client telling telling or, or sending back the data that we received as an object. So 
what we need to do is we need to serialize the data and then send it as a response so let's serialize the data serializer we use the same serializer uh, for our uh, uh, model okay so it's the car spec serializer and we tell wh what we need to serialize is the new car object so we add it here and after that we return a response with the serialized data okay I think that's it so let's save this and let's uh, start or run our server so we start a new terminal okay let's clear this and let's first activate our virtual environment and script activate and after that let's navigate to our Django project and then let's run the server so Python Py and server so now after we get the server running we need to go to postman which we can perform a post request and we see if our create function is working so let's let's leave the same data that we have here let's just change the model to for example m4 okay um, and this is the the url you know how we got it from the previous, previous tutorial and let's just send the post request it gave me an error see, saying here that serializer is not defined okay let's head back to our code and see what we did wrong here so here we have serializer okay yeah I, I misspelled this okay so I forgot I here now it must work let's wait for the server to rerun and then we perform another post request and here we go so the fact that we received this data back tells us that our post request was successful we got the data we saved it and to verify that we can go to our Django model or I mean Django admin Django rest framework admin panel and then we go to car specs and we check our last object and there here we go this is the m4 that we added just now okay so guys how is that useful or why would we need to rewrite overwrite I mean um, a create function uh, basically it helps if you need to add some kind of restrictions if you want to check the data before saving it to our to your database if you want to do some uh, <coughs> um, checking on type of data or values that you have there before saving it so here you will be able to perform some checks um, uh, or test, test, tests before you save the data for example uh, you might tell your, your, your API like if you receive this kind of model of this or this data or if you receive, uh, receive for example um, uh, an object with the production year that before uh, 2000 then don't save it okay and this helps in kind of type of security if you have uh, 
um, an API for you know for a social some kind of social media and um, you want to check for malicious you know some kind of posts uh, malicious data or some specific kind of data before saving it you know uh, adding some restrictions this is basically what uh, uh, you need to you know uh, override your create function for okay you can just add an if statement for example if you want to check this field on another field you know or compare it with an existing field okay uh, if you don't want to duplicate data so you you can perform a check here uh, for example if the object that you're receiving is already existed okay so you don't to uh, you don't want to have two objects with the, the same uh, value you know or have a specific um, uh, field in common okay you don't want you don't want that so you can perform all that uh, test here so I'll see if, if uh, may, I might have a tutorial also to just demonstrate an example of how to do some kind of checks how to access um, another um, model inside create and get some data and compare it with the data that we receive uh, and then decide whether we we're gonna save it or not so Thank you guys for your time and until next tutorial. Hello everybody, today's tutorial is about um, overriding the delete action inside uh, our view set, okay, or model view set. But before we override, let's see or let's experience the default behavior of um, delete action. To do that, first we need to run the server. Let's open the terminal. and activate the virtual environment after that we will run the server or oh, let's navigate to our application my API and then run the server So now let's perform a delete action by sending a delete request uh, to our API. Let's use the postman. So inside the postman here, first let's perform a get request and see what objects or what data we have. Okay. So here, as you see, we have the cars that we uh, stored or saved in previous tutorials and we need to delete one of those of, of, of these objects okay so to do that we just put the ID okay and the endpoint on the in the in the URL let's start let's put eight choose delete the this BMW M4 okay and let's change this to delete and let's send request so we don't know what happened okay it's supposed to be deleted okay in order to know that we need to perform a get request to see if uh, object with ID 8 still exists so let's do this if we if we see now um, there is no the M4 is not there anymore because we deleted it. But if you notice that we didn't get any response from our API to tell us that the the object has been deleted or not. So this is one of the reasons that we need to override a delete uh, action. Okay, uh, let's let's go ahead. Let's go there back to our view and do that okay so inside our view to override the delete action we need to uh, write a, a, a method here called destroy so let's do that 
and destroy takes uh, the same parameters or arguments that previous functions like create takes okay it's it's really simple guys we just need to say car to create an instant for an object uh, equals self dot get object and after that we need to delete this object dot delete okay so that's it that's this will do the job for us and we need to send a response return response uh, the response will tell the front end that the object has been deleted okay or the item has been deleted okay so let's try that here item has been deleted okay so let's try this and see if it works let's save what wait, wait for the server to rerun and then go let's delete the item with the id number four or object with the id number four so we put four here the id and we choose delete and then we send and as we see now we deleted the item and we got a response saying that item has been deleted which is a very good feedback okay another reason why we would need to override the delete action is to do some kind of you know uh, check like if this user that that logged in now allowed to delete this or not okay so inside our method here our action in order to get the logged in user we can use the request argument to get that okay so we just need to say here uh, for example logged in okay uh, user equal request dot user okay and that will give us uh, that will give us the user that's logged in now and performing uh, the delete request so after that let's change it back to user after that we can perform Oh, don't do that user okay and after that we can perform an if statement okay to put the condition like if logged in user is admin okay then you can perform the delete action okay and we can you know create a response here message uh, response message equal and we put this here okay but if the logged in user is not an admin okay else we don't want to perform the delete and the response message will be for example um, not allowed okay something like that let's do that here okay let, for example um, in here we change this to response message Okay, so now uh, let's try this or let's test and see if it works. 
Let's save it. Wait for the server to rerun. So inside here, I'm logged in as uh, as 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 not, not as an admin. Okay. So let's let's perform my get request again. Okay. So inside here, I'm not logged as an admin. Okay, how to know that? If I go to headers, for example, this is the token that uh, I'm logged in with, which is which is refers to. If we go to the admin panel, go tokens. This is Alan. Okay, so this is uh, not the admin. Okay, uh, and we we got here, you know how because here we have the tokens and tokens t is um, tokens are the unique ideas for our users and so this is the token that uh, uh, we need to send as a, as, a, as a header with our request in order to um, be authorized okay so this is not an admin okay and I need now to perform a delete action and send it by sending a delete request and see what response I get okay let's let's choose the item with the ID 3 and choose delete and send and as you see now here we get a response says not allowed so this is like one of the reasons that we need to overwrite and delete actions. Also, there is many reasons, depends on your applications. But basically, this is how we do it and will give you more control on your API. So that's it, guys, for this tutorial. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. In this tutorial, we will override the update or put method demonstrating what needs to be done when performing a put request to our API. So first we get the object that we want to update from our database. Then we take the fields that need to be updated and assign the new values to them. And after that we save the new object and then return the updated object. And to demonstrate that we will use two of the apps that we created previously one with the nested data and the other one without a nested data and let's start with the cars app and inside here if we look at the cars model it's a simple model that represents car specs and, and if we look here we we can see that there's a, we have a car brand car model production year body and type of the engine so in inside if we go to views.py we can simply see that we previously managed to override the get function or method and the post method. And now we need to override the put method. So let's define put method and add the parameters self request args and KW args okay and then after that inside this method first thing we need to do is get the object from the database so to do that let's let's name it car object for example and let's use the model name which is cars dot objects dot get and this that will get us the object that we need to update obviously because with the put request um, the object ID is uh, included in the URL at the end of the, the URL so this is how this method gets or knows which object which object to get so after that we need to extract the data from the request uh, so let's just name a variable data equal request the data after that we need to update the object values 
uh, to the new values that we received uh, from the request. So in order to do that, we simply say car object object dot we start uh, choosing the fields one by one. So if we go back to the model, we start with car brand and then car model until the end of the field. So uh, we add here car brand equal data and we put here the key of uh, car brand value so which is car brand and the same thing goes for the rest of the fields so dot car model equal data and here we add car model key third one is uh, production year equal same thing data and we add production year and what else I think the body and the type so car object dot car body equal data and the key and the last one is the uh, engine type so engine type equal data and we had here engine type okay so after we updated the uh, fields we need to save the new model so we simply say car object dot save after we save the car object we serialize the data of this object then we return the serializer or the serialized data so let's do that equal uh, cars we need we will use the car serializer and that we created in previous tutorials and simply here we add the car object and then we return a response with the serialized data let's test uh, uh, the put method now in order to do that first let's run the server so we type python manage.py run server and make sure your virtual environment is active so now the server is running let's go to the postman and inside here we need to add the URL for the um, the cars um, cars view or cars model so it's cars app forward slash cars okay let's perform a get request and see what what models we have or what objects we have and as you see here we have only one object inside our database that's a PMW car with the model and year and other specs so I want to update this information and in order to do that I need to request the object by its ID so I'll do this I'll add it to the URL the ID of the object so let's see if we can get it as you see we got it th back the same object and now we need to perform a put request including the data or the new data that we need to um, add to the object so let's change this to put and inside here I'm just gonna copy the data or the JSON data from here because the data that we need to send it needs to look like this okay it's simply an object with the fields uh, inside 
uh, and with the new values of each field or value of each field so let's for example update this year to 19 and let's say this is m4 and let's leave the rest as it is so now i need to perform the put request so if i click send as you see i got my object back with new data as you see here the m4 and 19 and as you see guys we managed to override the put method and update a specific object in our database uh, through a put request the next case we need to handle is updating an object that includes a nested data and for that we will use another app here which is the first app and we created that in previous tutorials and inside here if we go to models.py we can see that we have two models here the car specs and the car plan and these models are linked using many to one relationship represented by car plan field here and the foreign key uh, so here if we perform a get request we will see that we have a nested data inside car specs so let's see that so i'm gonna add the url here which is first app forward slash car specs and i'm going to perform a git request and as you see here we get two uh, objects and inside each object we have the car uh, specs plus the car plan which is uh, an object nested inside the car specs object so in order to update for example the first object here represented with the id1 um, i need to handle the update method or the update request differently and in order to do that let's go to our view here inside views.py and inside here i'm going to define an update method and why it's update here not put and that's because we are using a model view set from view sets here not an api view so i meant to use two examples to show you guys how to override uh, a put method inside an api view and do the same thing inside a model view set so let's carry on with the code so here this method will take the same arguments self request args and key w args and first thing we need to do is get the object that we need to update and let's name it car object let's use the same name and it's equal to self dot get object so that will be enough to get the object when we use the api view we had to write the name of the model for example car cars dot objects dot get but inside uh, a model view set we just need to say self dot get object after that we need to extract the data from the request so we simply type data equal request dot data the next thing we need to do is get the car plan object uh, so let, to do that let's name it car plan equal and we'll use the car plan model name dot object dot get and we'll use the plan name for that so plan name equal data and we'll give it the key plan name so we'll use the plan name to update the car plan after that 
we assign this value to the car plane field so we say car object dot car plan equal car plan and then we add the rest of the fields uh, which is the car brand car model and the rest of them so because they are similar to the previous example so I'm just gonna copy paste them just to save time so here uh, we managed to add all the objects or all the fields I mean so the next step is to save the model dot save after that we serialize this object using the car spec serializer we pass the object and then we return the serialized data so that should do it let's save it and wait for the server to rerun and now if we go to postman uh, and let's try to update the first object so let's request the ID so now that we have the first object um, we need to include the new uh, fields that I need to update let's add the curly brackets here So these are the, the basic fields from this object and we need to add one more field which is the uh, plan name for the car plan and because this object uh, was linked to the second plan I want to change that now to the first plan by changing the, the plan name and I can also change the other fields so let's say for example it's M4 2019 and let's change this to fuel for example and now uh, we perform a put request and all the fields or all the data should be updated so let's let's do that and as you see here we got the updated object back with the new data as you see here the nested object is the first plan not the second plan anymore and the rest of the fields also have been updated and now some of you might be wondering what if I want to update one field only like the production year only or the the, the model do I need to send the whole object just to update one or two fields and the answer for that is no you can update one field or two fields only uh, using what's called partial update or batch request which is listed here if you see batch and that's responsible for partial update and we will be talking about that in the next tutorial how to perform a partial update update one field or two fields inside uh, model view set and ABI view as well and we will see how can we implement the partial update inside the update method of our view set and ABI view without the need to override the actual partial update method so that's it guys for this tutorial I hope it was useful and until the next one hello everyone and welcome to a new tutorial today we are going to see how we can 
uh, link or create a relationship between two models in our database and that's a very important feature because it helps us uh, improve our database structure and make it more flexible and reliable so uh, to do that first let's create we previously created this car specs table or model which includes uh, uh, some information about the car so now let's create another model that tells us if uh, the car has warranty or how many years of warranty or if it has a finance plan okay let's let's do that uh, let's start by creating class and let's name it car uh, plan okay car plan and this will inherit from models uh, dot model and let's add some fields here so first field will be like <coughs> sorry the plan name okay so the plan name and this will be a chars fi char field and let's give it a maximum length of 20 that will be enough and the next one will be years of warranty okay years of warranty and this will be let's let's choose a positive integer and let's give it a default value uh, of one so it's one year of warranty there's a default value. Uh, finance plan And here we just we're just gonna write if it's available or not. Okay, uh, it's gonna be char field uh, max length twenty, and let's give it a default value of uh, unenable uh, unavailable. Okay. And let's define here uh, string that will return the plan name. Okay, so right now we created this uh, model here. Okay, for example, if I have a car or from buying a car. I need to know if this car uh, has insurance, has a finance plan, how many years of warranty, uh, insurance, for example, and all this data must be accessible when I, uh, for example, perform a GET request to get the information about the car. So, in order to achieve that, we need to link this table here or this model to this uh, model here, which is the car plan. Okay. To do that, we need to add another field here that will represent the relationship. And this field, field, let's name it, for example, car plan. And we can we we're gonna use and we're gonna use something called foreign key, okay? That will take an argument. First argument will be uh, the model that we need to link this car specs model 2 which is the car plan okay the next argument here will be on delete okay so we have to uh, define what's going to happen to this model if we delete or this object if we delete the and the the object the car plan object that's linked to it okay so we just need to in this case let's say if we have a car that has uh, information about use of warranty and finance plan so deleting this uh, object from here or a plan mustn't affect the object in the car specs I mean if we delete the plan if we have have a plan in our database and we delete it and that plan was linked to one car or two cars or more than than that so deleting the plan mustn't affect 
the, uh, the, the cars object. That's why we need to define here on delete and we need to uh, choose an option which is set null okay what that means uh, exactly it sets this field here to null if uh, the object that's linked to it uh, was deleted okay so and in order to get that to work we need to add one more argument here and which is uh, which is null equal true okay so with that being done we are all set in in, in our models.py okay so let's save it and to get that to work or to reflect on our database we need to do uh, the migration so as we know we spoke about this in previous tutorials every time we edit our models.py add things add models add fields we need to perform the make migrations and migrate in order to build those fields uh, and tables in our database okay so to do that let's open the terminal and let us activate the virtual environment activate okay okay I'm gonna spell this and let's navigate to our project folder and let's run the make migration migrations which is python manage to pi make migrations okay so the migrations uh, were made and now let's migrate So now that our database uh, is set and we have those tables in our database, uh, we need to access them or through our admin panel. So to do that, let's add the new model that we created, which is car plan, to our admin panel. Okay, and this is in the admin.py file. Just need to register it and save and now we can uh, run the server uh, and see uh, and add some data to the car plan okay so let's run the server and now we can go to the browser and here this is the admin link Okay, and let's sign in my API, put the password, and now as you see we have another um, uh, option here which is car plans, okay, and here we can add some data, okay, let's name this plan first plan, save it. Let's add another one, just name it second plan, and this will be two years and finance available. And let's add another one, uh, let's name it third plan, and this will be the freeze warranty and finance available. Okay, so now if we go, now that we, we uh, save this in our database, if we go to the endpoint of car specs, which is this, okay. If we check here, so what we we don't have any information registers. We we didn't store any cars yet, but what we can see here is we have the car brand, car model. Those are the normal fields 
for the for the model okay for the car specs model but we don't see the the, the field that we added recently which is this field the car plan and that's because we didn't add this field in the serializer okay so guys always remember if you add any fields and your models you have to uh, edit your serializer to accommodate that field because the serializer is like a kind of a link between your view and or your front end and the database so uh, let's add here the car plan field and save it I'm waiting for the server to rerun okay and now if we go here and refresh as you see here we have our car plan field added and if you notice here it's a drop down okay and that's very cool because it's already linked the car specs to the car plan um, uh, model and give me all the available plans so it's easy for me now I can just choose the first plan for example for this information here about the car and then just save my new object okay and as you see the data we got back includes all the fields uh, of the car specs plus the car plan but what's this number that we see uh, next to it and what's this value okay this value value represents the id of the uh, of the car car plan object for example the first plan has id of one second plan has an id of two third plan has an id of three so if we chose second plan we would see an um, id of uh, of two for example here okay so this we can use this id to for example after we receive this information we know that the car plan has this id of one uh, so in order to get the information about this car plan then we do another request with this id to the car plan um, model and we we can get the data back that's not practical because that requires two requests in order to get the whole information about this car so the 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 good or the the good option that uh, Django REST framework provides in order to get the nested information here for the nested relationship is is pretty simple. If we just come here and add something called depth equal to one, and we save it, then you will see now that we will we will be able to get the information about the car plan also within the, uh, the the JSON data that we received from uh, or the dictionary that we received from our uh, database so if I let me do another request here okay and look now instead of having the one only <coughs> which is the ID for this object we have the whole object and there will be more practical to read if you're in the front end receiving data so you don't have to do two requests okay <clears throat> so now we have a better way of viewing our data more readable and accessible but if you notice here we lost the car blame field after adding the depth one uh, the depth equal one okay and we can't add it anymore which means if i want to do a post now <clears throat> to add for example a new car okay uh, let's say m4 yeah and if i do a post request in to save the data so I'll be able to save the data but the car plan will be null and I won't be able to edit and even if I do it through uh, let's say a real life scenario or application which is which we can demonstrate using the the, 
the postman I mean if I add here another key here I have all the car uh, specs uh, model uh, fields added if I have uh, I need to add the car plan field to it okay and I supposed to be able to give it the ID of the uh, the car plan and it will be enough to save it in normal scenarios for example if I give it an ID of two this I'll get the second plan for example but if I do that now okay and if I perform this this uh, this post request now I'm gonna keep it on top just to make it easy to read so it's gonna, seem, it's gonna be the same sequence if I do a post request okay to store this object in the database let's send so I get I get back a response that tells me that you have been able to store this object there but it didn't read the plan it didn't take it didn't see it as as you know as a, a valid field so the solution for this is to override the create uh, method or action in our view and I have uh, a video about that a tutorial where I explained how to override uh, the create function okay so we're not gonna go through that again but we're gonna do some modification to to the action in order to to be able to accommodate the new field okay so if we go back to our views so there's the model views see those this this code is from the previous tutorials where we overrided the retrieve and the create and destroy function okay so let me comment out the create function okay so here we have i have all the fields that's coming from the endpoint or from the uh, the the request so the only field I need to add is the car plan okay let's add the car plan field and the car plan plan field it's not a string it's not an integer it's an instance of uh, a, a car plan object okay so the right way to do it is to get the object of the car model car plan model okay that's its id equal to the value that i'm getting here through my request okay so to do that we can simply first import the car plan model here okay i already imported it and we can come here and say car plan dot objects dot get and inside get we need to pass the ID of that object so the ID of that object it's here we can get it from the car data that we're receiving through our request okay in this case we'll be able to get the right uh, <clears throat> data for this field okay so we need to save this wait for the server to rerun and if we open our postman now and we add another car for example mm, let's choose m3 for example let's edit this okay and all fields are set now if we perform a post request to this so we get an error saying not enough values to unpack okay let's see if we made any mistake here oh we have to tell here that this value is for the ID so need to add an ID equal okay you want to the server to rerun 
and if we come back here and we perform the, the post request as you see we have been able <coughs> sorry to save the object plus the car plan object that's linked to it okay or related to it so basically this is how uh, you can do it guys to solve this problem so i think that's it for this tutorial guys uh, thank you for your time and ask if you have any question and until the next tutorial hello everyone in this tutorial we're going to talk about one-to-one -one relationship and it's basically a way of connecting two objects that are uniquely linked to each other okay and that means if we have an object number one and object number two when we use the one-to-one -one relationship object number one can only be linked to one object which is the object number two and the same case for the object number two can only be linked to object number one okay and to make this clear or to help you understand it better we need to demonstrate a real life scenario with it okay and i chose uh, for that the the post example okay like when you have a social media or web <clears throat> application or blogging application web application or some sort of um posts post you know platform where you post uh, some article or share some information and you get some likes on it like you have like you have dislike and all this stuff of rating you know so what i did here and <clears throat> i didn't want to go through all that uh, in this tutorial because we've done that in previous tutorials so i created a new app in our project i named it post and inside this app i created two models first is the posts which is uh, which is two fields one is the post title and the second one is the post body and i created another model uh, which is the post rates and that will contain likes dislikes uh, of our uh, posts and for each one of these uh, models uh, i created a view that will handle uh, the requests through our uh, urls okay or the urls that we configure so i configure two urls one for posts and the other one for post rates okay and inside the serializer i just set up the serializer uh, one serializer for each model including the fields that we need to uh, use okay so to get started i just want to run the server at the moment and show you um, the models in our admin panel and then we'll take it from there so let's, let's run the terminal and inside our terminal uh, let's first activate uh, the virtual environment and after that we'll run the server or oh, let's navigate to our project folder and then run the server And we'll wait for the server to run, then we'll go to open the browser. <coughs> Sorry, and then we'll go to the admin panel. And as we see here, I have the post rates and I have the posts. Okay. We're gonna send and receive data, I mean store data and sending 
post request and get get request through our postman okay um, not through the admin panel because it's better to use the postman to demonstrate a real life scenario when you posting and also when you getting the post so first before doing that uh, let's test our endpoints let's come here this is the endpoint or the URL for posts as I can as you see here I can create posts and the other one is post rates uh, okay let me see why it's not working let's go to URLs okay we didn't assign the right view for this so if we save now and refresh okay if we go now let's refresh this page and you get the last slide okay so now next step is to link these two models using one to one relationship okay so what i want to do here <coughs> is link this post rates to the post okay so let's add a field here and name this field rates okay and this field will be uh, will represent the relation shape okay dot one to one field and inside the field the one to one uh, I need to specify the model that I need to link which is post rates and I need to specify what will happen on delete which is I wanted to delete the actual model and basically guys that's it now we managed to link post rates to posts or posts to post rates in a one to one uh, relationship okay let's see how it works uh, let's save this so because i added another field here okay uh, it, it's telling me here that name post is not defined okay obviously because of this needs to be on top okay so we'll save this and because I added another field here I need to run the migrations <coughs> Okay, it's telling me that I need to give it um, a value, a default value. So let me do that here. And we'll say, just keep it this way. Okay, and now we managed to add the other field here okay let's run the server again okay let's go so now our two models are linked so let's say in real life scenario I'm creating a post okay so I want to send uh, type a post title post body and send it Okay, what I'm expecting from my API is to go create first a post rates rate object and then create uh, the post object. Okay, so where can we handle that is 
in our views so in our views we need to uh, override the create function and we do that by declaring a method called create and adding the uh, arguments to it those are the arguments and then inside we need to first get the data uh, from that's coming through our post request and to do that we can simply uh, let's say post data equals request dot data and after that we need to create um, as we said a post rates object what we do is we say new new rate equal post rates dot object dot create and then we pass the parameters. So what's the first field in our um, post rates uh, model is rate as likes and the second one is dislikes. So we add here likes equals uh, post data and we add here the ID which is gonna be likes not the ID I mean the key and the second one will be dislikes equal and then we also type the dislikes key okay and then we simply say save to save it and after we created the rates object now we create the post object uh, the post object let's say new post equal posts which is the model dot object dot create and then inside it we pass the parameters which uh, which is first one is the post title equal uh, post data and we pass the post title key second one is uh, post body and uh, it's equal post data and we'll pass the post uh, body key and the last one is the rates or rate let me make sure rates you remember rates <clears throat> is an object and it's actually the object that we just created and saved here so we simply type new rate and then after that we save the new post and then um, we serialize the data uh, but let's name it serializer equal uh, post serializer and we pass the new post and then we return response serializer okay so this should do 
the, the job for us. So what we, we've done here basically is we created the rates object and then we created the posts and we assigned the, the rates object to the new posts. And this is this what should happen when we when we send a post request with the new post details. Okay, so let's save this. And then let's go to our postman. So we go to we add the link for the posts, which is posts. Posts. Let's make sure this is the right link. Yeah. <clears throat> so here. So now to perform, uh, let's perform a get request just to test. Okay, we have no data yet. So to perform a post request, we choose post here. And normally inside the body here we go to form data and we add the fields as a key value pairs which means we add post title title post body the body and then rates is an object that must include uh, how many likes how many dislikes and uh, we can't edit in this field here okay so in order to perform this post request we need to cho choose another option which is the row okay inside row we can uh, structure a json uh, object and then send it uh, as, as a post request through our post request so let's start structuring the object that we need to send so what we need to send first we need to send the post title so we write post title and its value is first post and then the second second field is post body and its value is uh, let's write for example this is the first post and now when we come to rates so rates is an object we open another curly bracket and inside it we add likes let's say 10 likes this post has and we add dislikes which is let's say has one dislike okay so this is the data structure or the JSON object that we need to send so uh, I think I forgot to add something inside our view okay if we go here inside our view the way I uh, I extracted the data from the post request here or from the request data is wrong because here I said post data likes in this way likes supposed to be in this scope with the post title and post body but likes in order to get likes we need to access this first the object key and then the likes so to do that we just need to add here another square brackets and inside them we'll type rates and here <coughs> forget to type this post data Great. And this is supposed to do the job for us. Let's save.
and the serializer I need to add here depth equal one to see the nested uh, information or objects okay so if you go now to postman and then we perform the post request okay, let's see what error I'm getting here you call the URL via post but the URL doesn't end with a slash okay just okay I need to put a slash here and Let's see the error here. You said you pass a serializer instant as data, but probably you meant to pass serializer to data. Okay, let me see here in the views. Okay, this is my mistake here. Let me save it. It's good to have these mistakes so everybody can learn let's perform it now and as you see guys um, we we managed to perform post uh, request and we posted first post and um, the post body okay but uh, the reason why I'm not seeing the rates here because I think I didn't add it here Okay, so I'll go here, I'll add the rates. Okay, and then we save. And if I go back here and I perform a get request. Okay, I'll be able to see uh, the two objects, one I previously added, and this is the new one that we added, first post, this is the first post. And as you see here guys, we managed to um, perform a post request and we handled in our view uh, the post information and created a new rating and we assign that to our uh, uh, post so in in this case here if we go to the admin panel now let me add another post guys so you will be clear for you let's say this is the third post okay six for example and let's send it I managed to get it back so this is the post ID uh, this is the third post information and the rates this is a real scenario where you could use in your application or you know uh, your website what one-to-one -one does is I can't for example let's let's perform a get request so I'll explain to you something to you here now we have three objects here for example I can't or one-to-one -one relationship doesn't allow me to assign this object with the ID 5 to any other object except the ID the, the post with the ID 4 and if we go to the admin panel now just to demonstrate that for example if I go here to posts I see I have three posts here I want to add a new one okay so I'll add here for example uh, hello and let's say uh, this 
is a test post okay and if I come here and I choose for example this post trace object here which has been assigned to another post and click save you'll see I get an error here saying posts with this rates already exist so I previously added a post with that's linked to this object so I can't add this object to another post or this rates object to, other, to another post because it's one to one uh, uh, relationship and that's it guys for this tutorial hopefully it was useful if you have any question please leave it in the comment below and until the next one hello everyone in this tutorial we are going to discuss the many-to-many -many relationship and in order to understand the many-to-many -many relationship let's compare it with the many-to-one relationship which I made a video about previously and I will leave a link in the description for that video and for now let's see some graphical explanation that will help us understand the many-to-many -many relationship so in the many to one relationship we can link multiple objects of a model one to one object of a model two but each object of a model one can be linked to only one object of a model two at the time for example a post can have multiple comments linked to it but each comment can be linked to only one post at the time using the many to one relationship. While with the many to many relationship we can link multiple objects of model 1 with multiple objects of model 2. An example for that is a school system where you will link students with the modules that they are studying. So to implement the many-to-many -many relationship in our API, let's create a new app uh, and name it School. And to start, first let's activate the virtual environment. And then let's navigate to our project folder my API and inside here let's run python manage.py start app and let's name it score and as you see here we have the school folder available with the files inside it so let's go to model models.py and inside here I want to create two models first model is uh, modules which what the students will be studying so let's name it modules or you can name it module it's fine and inside here I'll have three fields first one is the module name so I can say module name And it's going to be a character field with max length. Um, I think 50 will be okay. And the second one will be the a module duration. Okay, so in months, for example, how long this module uh, takes, how much time uh, was allocated to this module. And let's have it as an integer or integer field. And the second one will have our third field will be the classroom. Okay, so let's have a classroom. 
and that will be also a number referring to the classroom and let's return the name of the module so then str method let's return the name so this is the first model that we need the second model that I would like to create is student so let's have it student you can name it student students whatever let's name it students because we already said modules there so okay sounds better and inside here we're gonna have the name which is the student's name and it'll be correct to field the max length of I think yeah 50 is enough as well and the second field will be the age and it's an integer third field will be uh, the grade and it's an integer as well and the last field is the field that we need to use to link uh, the modules model with the students model using the many to many relationship so we can simply say modules equal models dot many to many fields and inside here we just specify which model we need to link to which is the modules and let's return the name of the student and now as you see the models are ready so let's save this and let's go to the admin.py and add these models there so we can see them in the admin panel so let's import, it, import them first we need to import the modules and students okay and then we register them register the first one the modules and then we register the second one to the student okay let's save that and now let's add the new app that we created to our installed app so our API can acknowledge that and uh, let's write here score and save it and then now we should run the migrations so Python by make migrations first and as you see here we have done two migrations the modules and the students and then now we can run the migrate and now the migration is done so in order to see this in our admin panel let's just run the server now And let's go to the browser and refresh and as you see here we have two we have our app here the school and we have the two uh, models that we created so if we go to the first one 
uh, and let's create some modules here for example let's start by for example math and let's say four months the duration classroom number one and let's save it and let's add another one which is um, physics for example physics and it's also four months classroom two and one more let's for example add the history and then duration three months for example and the classroom four and now if we go add a new student to our database basically we can add the name let's say for example uh, Alan at the ages 18 grade 12 and this is the interesting part as you see here we have three options which are the modules that we created and as you remember in the many to one relationship we used to have here one option okay so we we could create uh, add uh, one field only but in this case with the many to many relationship I can add all the the modules that I've created link them to the uh, to this particular student so I can just mark them all uh, using control and you know choosing one by one or command if you're using a Mac and then I can simply save and if I open this again I'll see that it's saved and I have three modules linked to this user and I can add another student for example let me go back to students I can add another student uh, for example mark and then age of 17 grade uh, 11 and then I can choose that for example mark is not doing math is doing history and physics only and then I can save it and now I have um, two students uh, with different uh, modules linked to them and now let's create the necessary files that will allow us to access the school app from a custom endpoints so let's go back to VS code and inside the school app I'm going to create a new folder and name it API inside here I'm going to create three files the first one is the serializer dot pi and the second one will be views and the third one will be URLs and let's start with the serializer.py and first we need to import the serializer from REST framework so let's type it out serializers and then we need to import the models from our models.py file uh, and they are modules modules students and now let's create two serializers one for the modules and one for the students so let's create a class and name it modules serializer and it's going to inherit from serializers.model serializer and inside here let's specify or add the class meta 
and let's add the model name which is modules and the fields which are um, ID because we need to get the, field, the, the objects ID and let me check the model so we have module name, module duration, and classroom. So we need to add that. So here module name and then module duration and then uh, classroom. Okay. And let's create second class and it's a student serializer and it's going to take same thing the model serializer and let's first specify the class meta the model name will be students and fields will be the ID name age and grade and the last one is the modules okay I think that's it let's check the model so it's name age grade modules and I'm gonna get here depth equal one to get the nested data okay so let's save this and the second thing we need to do is to add uh, the views classes inside views.py so let's go to views.py file inside here we need to add two classes one is for the students and uh, one for the modules and we will use uh, a model view set so I'm gonna copy paste the code here just to be more efficient and save time because uh, it's just a simple code so we're importing the view set and then the response and then after that we're importing uh, the models that we need to use and then which is the student the students model and the modules model and then we're importing the serializers from uh, the serializer.py file in order to use them inside our views to serialize the data and then we create the views classes so first class or first view will be the uh, students view set and it's a model view set uh, we specify the serializer that we need to use which is the students serializer and then we add a normal git query set method which will take all the objects from a student and then send them back to us okay uh, okay so the second thing or the second class is the modules you can just simply paste here and then just edit it so it's the modules uh, view set and the serializer will be modules serializer And inside here we can just type module and we get query set from the modules model and module here so basically that's it for the for now for the views.py let's save it and now let's create the endpoints uh, for the school app inside urls.py and again I'm gonna paste the code here because it's pretty simple and here we're using rest framework routers 
to specify or add the two endpoints that we need and allocate a view set for each uh, endpoint. So as you see here, we're registering a student as an endpoint with the student view set and module with the module view set. And then we including them inside the URL pattern. So let's save this. And then let's go to the main project urls.py file and then include the endpoints uh, that we created inside the school app inside the uh, project urls.py file. So to do that, let's copy this. And then here we can initiate the endpoint or start the endpoint with the school referring to the app. And then we replace the posts with the school which refers to uh, school app. So here uh, all the, the URLs or endpoints inside uh, urls.py will be included. So let's save this file now and check the and I'm getting this error here that says cannot import uh, name student serializer because uh, I think I misspelled it. So let's see serializer.py file and I can see here I forgot to put an S so let's save this and wait for the server to rerun and our server now is running and now it's the time to test the endpoints so I'm gonna run postman here and I'm gonna perform a git request to the student endpoint so I'm gonna type here school slash student then I'll send the request and as you see here in the JSON data I'm getting back the two student that we added in our database using the admin panel Alan and Mark and then also I'm getting as a nested data here uh, inside the student object the modules that each student is taking so that's very good and now I can also uh, request a specific student by just adding its ID as you see there and then perform a git request and now I'm getting uh, only Ellen or I can get Mark as well so by changing the ID so I'm getting uh, the other student and the next thing we need to do is to handle the post request and in order to do that first let's add a JSON object here to represent the new student that we need to add to our database okay and for that I'm just gonna copy this here this object and just do some modifications so we don't need the ID uh, we'll add a new name for example John and then let's say John is 16 and he's in grade 10 and for the modules I just need to add an array of objects that represent the name of the module only okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the extra data here okay I'm just leaving the name of the module because we will need to query using this name so this is this is basically the data let's edit the URL this is the object that we need to add or the new student that we need to add with the modules that uh, will be allocated to this student and now if we perform a, a post request I get the user object back which means the user or the new user has been created 
uh, and saved in our database. But if you look here, no modules have been added. And to solve this problem, we need to override the create function inside our view. So let's do that. So we go to views.py. Inside here, we need to add the create function. So let's define the create function and add the uh, arguments that we need. And inside here, first thing first, we need to extract the data from the request. So let's say data equal request dot data. Okay, and after that, we need to um, create a new student. So let's say new student equal student the mod the model name dot objects dot create. And inside here, we need to add uh, the fields. So if we look at, at the model here, we need name, age, grade, and modules. So let's start by adding them. Name equal data, and we give the key name. And then after that, age equal data, and we give the age. We do the same thing for the grade. And this will be enough to save the student. So let's do new student dot save. So now that we saved the student, we need to add the modules that we received from our post request to this particular user. And in order to do that, uh, we need to loop through the list or the modules list and then add each object that's represented by the, by the by the module name inside this list to this user. So to do that, we say, for example, for um, module in uh, data modules, and that refers to this here. So this will give us back the list. What we'll do now, we'll grab the uh, module object from the database. So we'll say uh, module uh, object, for example, equal modules. Uh, let me just make sure I'm using the right name. Yeah. Okay. So modules uh, dot object dot get and inside here we'll use the module name name equal module which is this one and we'll add the key uh, module name so what we did is we we looped through this list and for each object inside li this list, we grabbed the value associated to the module name, uh, module name key. Uh, so now, after we uh, get the object, we need to add it to the new student object. So how we do that? We simply say new student dot field modules dot add 
and then we add the module object. So this for loop will go through each object inside the module list and add it, um, add the, the module object associated to that module name to this new student. And when that's done, we need to uh, serialize the, the data. Type serializer equal uh, student uh, serializer. And then we add the new student. And then we send uh, or we return a response with the serialized data. So serializer to data. And that should do it. So let's save it. And let's go test uh, this view inside our postman. So I'm going to just change here the name, for example, make it uh, uh, Steve and leave the rest as it is. And then now I'll perform the post request. And as you see, I got the new student object plus the modules associated to that student or allocated to that student. So that's it guys for the many to many relationship. So we saw what's the difference between the many to many relationship and the many to one relationship. We uh, implemented uh, the many to many relationship in a practical example and we saw how we can perform a get and a post request to handle the data. And in the next tutorial, we'll be talking about the update method, how to override it in order to get our data updated. And until the next one. Hello everyone, in this tutorial we are going to learn how to use the string related field in our serializer to represent the target of the relationship between two models using the str method. And to demonstrate that I created a new app called Alpums using python manage.py start app and then inside the models dot pi file I created two models one is album the other one is track and this first one will represent the albums or specific uh, of a specific artist for example and the tracks inside each album will be represented by the uh, model track and they are both linked to each other as you see using a foreign key which is uh, many to one relationship. So in this case for each model I can have I mean for each album uh, I can have multiple tracks okay uh, which makes sense. So we need to find a way when we request uh, or we perform a get request to the albums we need to find a way to get all the tracks related to this album. And in order to do that, we need to use something called string related field in our serializer, which is relies on the str method inside uh, our uh, track album. So if we go to the serializer, I have a simple serializer here that serialize the data between a uh, client and our API. So if I go now and perform, if I run the server and perform a git request to, to the URL that I configured here inside urls.py, so I configured an album to get the albums track to get the tracks using the default router. And if I use uh, the album link, to get uh, all the objects or the albums that I stored already, I'll be able to get 
all the objects or all the albums and each object will be represented by its ID, album name and artist. So to do that, let's run the server first. Obviously, after you create the app, I, I did create this app uh, just to save time during the video because we've done this before. But when you create the app, please, after you add your models, make sure you run the migrations. Uh, Python managed it by make migrations, then migrate then you can run the server so i'm going to, just going to run the server now python manage.py run server i'm going to wait for the server to run and then i'm going to open postman and perform a get request to the this url music albums okay so i'm going to open the postman I'm gonna open a new tab and I'm just gonna type the link which is music forward slash albums and then if I perform a git request here I can see that I have two albums here that I previously stored in the database album 1 and album 2 and these two albums here, uh, for example, the album one, one contains three tracks, but it doesn't show here. So I'm going to find a way or I'm going to use the re string related field inside the serializer to represent or, or to, to show the target relationship using the str method. So to do that, I'm just going to go back to my code and open the serializer and inside here inside our album serializer because we need to uh, get the uh, related tracks when we perform a git request to the album serializer so inside here i'm going to declare a variable called track equals uh, serializers dot string related field and inside here I'm gonna add many equals true because I have many objects uh, and also because of the type of the relationship that I'm, that I'm using which is many to one so now I need to add this variable here to the list or the, to the field and by doing that, now if I perform a git request to the album uh, link, I'm supposed to get the album. Within the album, I will get all the tracks, or within the album object, I'm supposed to get all the tracks that are related to that album. So I'm going to save this. And obviously, to, just to mention, each track will be represented by this str method, which is takes the order of the track and the title of the track. So I'm going to head back to the postman. And now I'm going to perform another get request. And I'm getting an error here. Let me see what's the error. album object has no attribute track so let me go back to the serializer so the name here is track and if I go check the models oh okay I the related name here tracks so I'm supposed to name this here tracks to refer to that related name so if I save this and wait for the server to rerun and then go back to the postman and perform a git request as you see now I get the two album objects and inside the first album object I could simply see that I managed to get the tracks which is a list of three tracks that I linked to the album one and they are represented inside the album object.
and that was easily achieved by simply adding one line of code here uh, and using the string related field to get the related object uh, to this album hello everyone in this tutorial we will create a custom user model and, re and the reason why we would do that is because we need to extend our user model and have more control on it at the moment the user model is basically just the username email password and we need to add more to that and in order to do that we need to create a new app in our Django project and name it for example users app so let's let's do that first let's activate uh, the virtual environment and then let's navigate to our project folder my API and inside here we need to uh, start the new app which is the user or users app and to do that we can basically say python manage.py start app and we'll name it users app oh i think user app will be okay and if you notice here we managed to create a new app uh, which is contain, contains the necessary folders and files. Uh, so now to start structuring our uh, custom user model, let's go to models.py. And inside here, we need two classes. First one is the user manager. and that will inherit from base user manager and the second class is the user class and this will inherit from abstract base user and permissions makes in okay so the first class is responsible for the the user object creation and the fields needed for that and the second one is basically the user model or the fields that we need to um, add to the user model uh, so let's start with our user manager class and inside the user manager class let's create a private method which is the create user method that will handle the user creation so we'll type create user and inside here we'll add all the necessary arguments that that's that are needed for the user creation okay so we'll start by username sorry for that email password and we can specify some fields like um, for example if the, this user is uh, is a staff member is it or is the user super user uh, or is the user active not active so we can specify that also here so we can basically add more fields like is active for example or is uh, staff and is super user and at the end 
we'll leave the we'll add an argument for extra fields that we might need to add to this user okay and inside this method let's do some validation and specify some information so say first if or let's check if the user is valid and to do that we can simply say if not user which means if the user is not provided we need to raise an error which is a, a type of value error okay so we'll say value error and we'll say uh, the given in user name is not valid okay and the second field we need to check or argument that we need to check is the email so email equal and we need to use something called normalize email and that will convert all the or the, the domain part of the email to lowercase and now we can create the user by saying oh the user model by saying user uh, equals subject model and inside here we can specify the arguments so we say uh, username equal username email equals email and we're not gonna add we're gonna skip the password now because we can use another way to set the password outside of the the model outside of this function here um, so we can uh, set the other specifications like is is this user active so we choose to decide if it's active now or not so maybe we can uh, just leave the user uh, or the user will be won't be active until they verify the email then we set this field to active and uh, for example or you can put it uh, true and the, the user will be active immediately this is just some let's say a checkpoint for you where you can instead for example after you create the user let's say the user is not uh, using your website anymore so instead of deleting the user from from your database you can simply set this field into false which means the user is inactive or while the user is active you can it's it's the this field is like true so you choose what to do there with this for example the second or the other uh, field or argument is is staff equal and then is super user equal is super user so basically here we're just adding the arguments and then we can specify some other fields here for example we can add the, the time when this user joined the the website or uh, signed up for for the website and to do that we can just simply say for example date joined and then we can let's say equal for example now and then we specify now here now equal time zone dot now okay so this will give us the time the actual time and the last argument will be the extra fields okay so now after we created the user uh, the user object uh, we need to set the password dot set password and this will take password as argument and then we save the object user dot save we specify this using 
the database. Okay, and then we return the user object. So the private method that we created is, uh, I think it's complete now. So what we did basically, we specified the arguments that we need for the user creation. And then we did some validation in it. We created the user object model with the needed fields or necessary fields. And then we set up the password and then we saved the object and we returned the object. So in order to use this private method, we need to call it from a normal method inside our user manager class. And to do that, we simply define a new method we call create user. And this uh, method will take a username, uh, email, password, and the extra field argument. And inside the create user method, we need to call the, our private uh, create user method and then return the result uh, or the user object created there. So basically we can say return self create user and then we pass the argument username uh, password or email let's turn the email password we can specify that is this uh, is this uh, user or is active for example if is active then we, we set up this, for example, is active equal true. Is it stuff equals, it's not stuff, false. And is uh, super user, and that's false as well. And let's check the sequence here. So username password yeah is active is tough is super user and then at the end we add the extra field so I think that's it I think that will will do the job let's save this so now we have the actual uh, method to create the user and we added the arguments that needed here. So this method will create a user, a normal user, like uh, in the scenario where the user sign, signs up to, to your service or website, this method here will be used. Uh, what we need to use now, what if we need to create a super user as in our API. So we need to define another method to create a super user. And this will take some arguments as well, like username, email, password, and extra fields. And inside here, uh, we'll say user equal, we'll use the private method, create user. <clears throat> and here, we'll specify the username, email, password, And we'll simply say that this user is active, true, and is stuff true, for example, is super user true, because this is a super user that we're creating, and we 
mustn't forget the extra field fields argument okay so after that we need to save this object and then we return the user object okay so with that being done i think we're done with creating the user manager class which will be responsible for creating a new user and creating a super user as well okay uh what's next let's head to the user class and now let's add the user model fields inside uh, the user class and to do that let's start by username and the username is a char field so we're gonna say models dot char field and we'll specify the mm, maximum length which is uh, let's say 30 for example and then we'll say it's unique and that means uh, like two users we can't have two users with the same username okay and after that the second field we can add uh, the email and it's an email field so it's uh, models dot email field and inside the email fields we can specify the maximum length uh, which is going to be 250 for example and it has to be unique okay after that we can add like first name equal mm, it's a chart field as well and that will take uh, maximum length uh, 30 we can specify some other stuff here for example uh, the user doesn't have to have first name and last name, so we need to add uh, blank true null true because this field is not a crucial field. I mean, the user is not obligated to add a first name and, and last name. In this case, we can make it otherwise. Last name, do the same. blank true null true and what else can we add okay uh, we can add the is active is active and it's a it's a boolean field because is active it's either it's true or false so it's a, a boolean field and we can add the default to false or let's keep it true let's 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 have a true as a default value is stuff Uh, also boolean and by default uh, it's it's uh, false uh, is super user
also boolean and the default value is false and so what other fields we can add here uh, we can add for example the date joined the date that the user joined and it's a date and time field and we can give it a default value of time zone dot now and what else we can add we can add for example another boolean like for example, uh, receive newsletter, for example, okay. We can simply say uh, receive newsletter. And we can specify this as a Boolean. And we can like, you know, ask the user if they want to receive uh, uh, a newsletter from our, our website and if yes then we change this value uh, what else we can add we can add a uh, birth date or the date of birth and this is also a date date time field and I think we should, because this is these are not compulsory, uh, we should add like blank true null true. Can we can do this also on the top? I'm just gonna copy, paste this. This is okay, this is okay, this is okay. Okay, let's leave it this way. Uh, what else we can do? add? Uh, for example, address. Address, we can add address one, address two. We'll, keep, we'll just say address for now. And it's a char field or character field and you can specify the maximum length for example uh, 300 and paste this it's not compulsory yeah we can add other stuff like for example phone number for example okay we can add like city for example city we can add as much as we need to add or to specify about the user uh, and and basically we just need to specify the fields and all the extra fields here uh, that we added we are able to add it because also we if, as you remember we added extra fields here so which means these fields are included plus the extra fields that we might add in our model so basically we can add as much fields as we want uh, to specify or to have more information store more information uh, about the user we can add like for example and about me and this I'll put this also blank and null about me for example you can specify like a text field okay it will be like for example let's say 500 and yeah so 
we we manage to add more fields have a more control in our user class or user model uh, what else I'm thinking of is like we can add even a profile image profile image and this will be models dot uh, image fields and we'll set it to null two. Okay, so these are the fields that I could think of at the moment. You can edit it, you can add whatever you want. The next thing we need to do is to create an object uh, instance of the user manager, and by doing that objects equal uh, the user manager class and next we need some to specify some settings variable like uh, the username field and which is uh, the user name must be small letter and we need to specify the required fields for the user object the required fields is a list uh, that we need to add and for now I think email is the most important thing and i think that's it guys for the user class so we can save it now after saving that after we create the user user manager and user class let's import the necessary uh, classes here like base user manager and abstract user base and to do that we need to type this from so let's import it from django dot contrib dot oath dot models we need to import permissions maxim and I think I misspelled it here yeah okay and then let's import the base user manager Django uh, Django dot contrib and abstract base user so these are the main the other thing we need to import is the time zone so from Django dot utils import time zone okay because we needed to create the drawn date let's save this file so I think that will do it the next thing we need to do is we need to go to our setting .py, the project settings file and specify and tell our project or API that we need to use this model here as our user model okay so how to do that let's go to settings so here inside inside the settings.py 
let me scroll down. First, let's add the user app to our apps here. So to make sure it will be installed and let's head to the bottom here and specify the auth user model. So we'll need to type auth user. Okay, let's make it all capital auth user model. And it must be the user app dot user. And that tells the, the, the API that we need to use the auth user model from the user app uh, dot user, which means it'll go to the user app, which is here. And then it'll go to the models and use this user here, user class. Okay, and after that, inside REST framework here, we need to add the serializer. Okay, so what we need to do is uh, type here user details serializer. Okay, and this will tell our API to use the serializer and the app that we created. So it's inside user app, so lowercase user app dot uh, serializer dot and serializer will be, I'll name it user details serializer. So it's user details serializer. So I think we should go create the serializer now. Okay, let's save it and let's let's go to our user app to let's create the serializer.py here new file. And inside here I'm just gonna copy and paste the code just to save time because there are a lot of typing in and then exp I explain what's going on. So first thing first we have two classes here the register serializer and the user details serializer. This user details serializer will be used to serialize the data that we post and get from into our API and the register serializer will be used uh, when the user when we register a new user okay so inside here as we see we specify the normal fields using the serializer from uh, rest framework and we specified the first the email which is the email field and we we said it's we we pass here an argument saying so required here if it's required or not required that depends on the settings okay so this argument here if we just copy this and we move to our settings and we go here and specify that account email required and then we set it we set this to true or false whatever we put here is what will be the settings for the email field okay uh, first name second name uh, also we can specify if they are required not required if they are write only write read all that restrictions that we can put to each field of the fields that we can uh, or we need to to add here okay we can add more fields like as I will edit here first name last name address I can add the city I can I can do the restrictions okay any of the fields that we use in our uh, user model password one password two are the are required as well because you need to provide a password and verify the password what else then we go to we have some 
validation methods. So first one will be validating the password to see if the password is, is it short, does it contain, uh, um, for example, uh, only, only numbers or does it have numbers with characters? So is it a common password or not? This will be validated here. And according to that, we raise an error or a warning or other messages to the user. And inside validate also we can validate if the password one equal or does it equal password two. So because both passwords must, ma must match. And if not, we can ra raise a validate error, validation error as you see here and send it back to the user and custom sign up we, we we're not going to address this in this tutorial so we can get rid of it and the get cleaned uh, data will give us all the the data from the fields or the cleaned or validated data and then we we had to save in the serializer save method and the save method is what we what's happening here simply is we creating a user object and then we uh, we using the adapter to get a clean data and then after that we save the user uh, object through a request and uh, yeah, we return the object. That's it. That's all. Uh, and inside the user details serializer, we specify the user model and the meta class meta, which is user, and the fields that we need to uh, our we need our serializer to deal with when we perform a post or get request or other requests. And these are the fields that we added there basically. The first name, last name, address one, two. I didn't add address one, two. Maybe I should, I should delete this. Let's check the model. Uh, yeah, I added only address. So we can add the address. Uh, phone number, I didn't add it. So you can add it guys country, city, all that stuff you can add. Uh, I added city, about me, profile picture, also zip code, all these guys are fields that you, you can add there and then you use it. But I'm gonna keep it short here. And basically that's the serializer. And now guys, let's <coughs> add uh, the user model to the admin.py so let's import it first from dot models user and then we register it admin dot site dot register and we put the user and we save. So now after we created the user manager, the user model, and we edit the settings to refer to the new user model that we'll be using. And we told our REST framework that uh, the user details realizer will be in the user app uh, directory serializer file and added the app to our, our installed apps now what we need to do next is is to run the make migrations and migrate to set up uh, the database and add the new uh, user table there and then we can run the server and go to the admin panel and see the user there and how uh, the configurations and code that we wrote reflected in, in our API. So let's do that. So we do python manage.py so 
missed E here. And as we see, created user model or model user. And then now we migrate. And as we see, all the tables uh, have been created. And now that we ran the migrations and we know uh, that our custom user model table has been created in the database let's create a super user and try to log in so we type python manage dot pi create super user and let's give it a name admin and email admin at my api dot com uh, let, let's set a password let's verify the password and now that the super user has been created successfully let's run the server and let's go to the browser and try to log in okay let's navigate to the admin and let's say admin let's put the password and here we go we managed to log in with the super user that we created and if we look here down we see the user app that we created and inside here we can check the users and this here is the admin user and if we go add user we can see here that we have extended the user model uh, into more uh, practical and more advanced user model and can, as we see here we have all the fields that we added uh, into our uh, custom user model like as the, as the first name last name as active stuff and is super user plus the date joined and we also the receive newsletter birth date all of this useful information about our user now is accessible and editable so that's it guys for this tutorial i hope it was useful and you learned something new and if you have any question please leave it in the comment below i try to make it as short as possible hello everyone in this tutorial we will see how can we improve our api performance and achieve a seamless user experience using multi-threading and why would we need to use multi-threading in our api well the reason is that sometimes we need to perform a time consuming tasks in our uh, project like for example sending an email or maybe uh, doing some calculations and uh, behind the scene or maybe you're running an AI model that requires some processing or data processing in the backend before um, storing or updating some data in your in your database uh, for example if if your project requires an image recognition and that's considered a time-consuming task so that should be handled differently also let's say your project is handling a social media uh, web app or a mobile application and uh, when someone uploaded or posted a new uh, post or video or, or anything picture you want to send notification or maybe email uh, the related users to that to that particular post then you might need to send like hundreds of emails or messages to some users and that can't be handled uh, normally as a normal function in our for example view method or you know like view uh, create method or uh, update method or any other method so it needs to be handled as a task as a thread so it doesn't cause any delay 
or lagging in our API performance. So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna use one of the applications that we created uh, previously in this series, uh, which is posts, to send an email every time I create a new post. And the first approach or the first thing we would think of is to create a method inside our post view set which will handle the email sent whenever I create uh, a new post and inside the create method here we will just call this function after we save the new post that we receive from the API client. So let's do that first and see how can we improve that. So I'm going to come here inside this post view set class and I'm going to create a method. I'm going to name this method uh, send email. Okay. And inside this method we will send the email. So this method will take as arguments the message or the email body so let's keep it as a message then the subject of the email and also the recipient list so the recipient list is the list of emails that we need to send this message to and inside here we can use uh, send mail uh, from uh, Django mails which is I previously imported here so from django.core.mail we import send mail and we can use it here so inside here we can we need to add one more argument for the send mail which is uh, from uh, mail or from email uh, so I'm going to add it here which is this is my email and now we can use the send mail here so first thing we add the subject then the message after that we add the from mail or from email after that we add the recipient list uh, which is I'm gonna copy from here And the last thing we add is uh, the fail silently and set it to false. So this will send the mail or the email for us. Bear in mind that this function here won't work if we don't um, add some settings to our settings.py, our project settings.py for handling the email, which is I'm going to show you at the end of this video. So let's save this for now. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to call this function here uh, inside our create uh, method. So after a new post um, dot save, we need to call self dot send email and then we need to pass the arguments uh, so the message will be for example uh, this is a notification let's just name it that and after that the sub uh, or this first takes message subject then the subject will be a notification and then we'll add the recipient list so I'm going to add the same email here so I'll be sending an email to myself which is okay and that should do it so let's save that 
and let's run our server please make sure your virtual environment is activated so I'm gonna type here Python manage dot pi run server and after that I'm gonna go to the browser and navigate to the post URL and try to add a new post so let me open the browser inside here I'm gonna go to post forward slash post and click enter and as you see this is these are the previous posts that we added so I'm gonna get add a new post here and I have email opened here so it's gonna show me if I receive any new email so I'm gonna add the post here let's say hello from API and the post body will be like uh, for example this is the post body and now I'm gonna click post and as you see here it's still processing so what was it was doing it received the post request and then after that it executed the uh, send email function and waited until the send email is completed then sent me back the response so that was for one email and you saw that it took like two to three seconds imagine if you're sending like 400 or, or thousand email if you have that big application the delay will be like in minutes or maybe hours so we don't need that and if we go check our email now we can see that I received a new email here let me just expand this saying this is a notification okay so which means working is just not the best approach or not the right approach for that so let's use now multi-threading to improve the API performance and get better user experience in order to do that I'm going to create a new class here and I'm gonna name it uh, handle notifications for example and this will inherit from threading or threading dot thread obviously we need to import threading and inside here I'm gonna define and initiate method in it and this method will take self as an argument plus all the email uh, arguments that we used previously with uh, the send email uh, method here so I'm just gonna copy them and paste them here and inside uh, the init method I'm just gonna get these uh, arguments here so I'm just gonna say self dot message equals message sorry and then self dot subject will do the same for the rest equal subject and self dot recipient list equals recipient list and then I will initialize the thread so I'm going to type threadings dot thread dot initialize and then I'll pass I'll pass the self as an argument one more method we need to add which is the run method so this method will get executed when we call the the class dot start 
so inside the run method I'm gonna perform the send mail so I'm just gonna copy this from here and paste it here because it's gonna be the same thing uh, and I'm going to add self to subject message and recipient and that will get us these uh, variables here so and from email will be this variable here because this is not going to change so I didn't pass it as an argument uh, but the recipient list might change I might change um, and add different emails so I think this should do it so I'm going to save this and inside the post view set instead of calling the send mail or send email uh, method I'm going to comment this out and underneath I'm going to call the handle notification class and pass the arguments that we previously passed here to the send email function so I'm going to uh, copy them and paste them here and then uh, I'm going to add dot start to trigger the run uh, method and this should do the work so let me save this and then go to the browser and inside the browser I'm just gonna perform another post request so I'm gonna I'm just gonna edit this and say for example add to and here this is a post body 2 and then perform a post request but before that I want you guys to notice that the difference between the delay for the response to come from the API so in the previous request we noticed that uh, we had a delay like for two three seconds before we got back the, the response but now if we perform a post request which is I'm gonna do now we'll see if I click post I'll see I get back the, the response immediately from uh, our API and now at the meanwhile the thread is executing the send mail to send an email to the user so if we go my email here I'll see that I received a new email here which is, says this is a notification so it did the same work but we got a better performance and more seamless user experience from our API and this applies on many use cases as I mentioned before so before we end this tutorial I just want to show you guys the settings that we need to add to our settings.py file in our project in order to get the email to work so these are the variables that we need to provide so first one is the email backend which is from Django the email host is the smtp.gmail because I'm using gmail mail server and then comes the the username or the email host user this is your email and the email host password this either can be your email password or a password uh, for example if using gmail you can create a new app for for your project and then you will get uh, a specific key or password which you can edit here and then you add the port and the TLS option so yeah that's it and then you can uh, start sending emails obviously this will change if you're using another mail server or another account hello everyone in this tutorial we will see how can we schedule a task in our Django REST framework API and get it to run in the background 
And there are a lot of use cases for that. One of them is, let's say you want to send a newsletter to your users or to your subscribers every week. Okay, you can do that. Let's say you want to back up your database or your data every day at maybe certain time. You can do that. Another use case for that is connecting to an external services or APIs to uh, collect some data and then maybe store it in our database or use it for some other functionalities. And this is what we're going to do in this tutorial in order to see how schedule works. So for that, I created an application inside our project uh, and I named it weather using Python managed.py start app weather. And what we need this application to do is to connect to external API uh, that holds weather data, fetch this, this data and store it in our database so we can use it in our own way in the future. So basically, if we go to the models.py, I created a model here, it's, I named it forecast. It has a symbol four fields, which is the timestamp, temperature, uh, description, and city. So we'll be getting the temperature and the description of the weather for a specific city. Okay. And in the views.py, I simply created a view set, a weather view set uh, that will serve the requests through the URL, which is uh, weather uh, forward slash data, because I added here in uh, the root URLs.py. So uh, this is it here, it's included. And in the serializer, I added a serializer for that model that will help us serialize the data. So at this stage, we'll be able to communicate with this application, save data or get data. And if I run the server now, obviously, guys, um, uh, after you create this, please uh, run make migrations and then migrate and then uh, run the server. Uh, I did that already, so I'm just going to run the server. And I'll wait for the server to run. Then I'm going to go to the postman. And if I perform a GET request, I'll see I still have nothing in uh, the database. So we're not going to store anything in the database manually. We'll just handle this uh, through our scheduled uh, function, which will go and get the data from the uh, weather API and then store it in the database. Then we'll be able to see it here when we perform a GET request. And for that, I'm going to use a service called, um, let me just open the browser. It's called Open with a Map. And this will give me an API endpoint where I can use to get the weather data of a specific uh, <coughs> city. So, uh, after you sign up for this, I'll leave a link in the description for this um, website. After you sign up uh, here, you will get an API key, uh, which will allow you to perform the request. Obviously, there's a limit for how many requests you make per minute, but you can also buy one of their plans. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very nice service. Um, so, here, uh, I can see here the APIs or API call. Uh, and what's what's the requirement here? The requirement here is, uh, for example, the city name and the API key or the city name, the state code and API key. And that's what I'm going to use. So first, I'm going to try to do a request using Postman and see what type of data I can get from this API. So let's do that.
So this is the API that I'm going to use. I'm going to use the weather of London and then I provided the key for uh, the API and then I'm just going to send a get request and as you see here I get a lot of data about the weather so I'm going to choose some of these fields here or objects to store in our database which is for example the uh, the city the temperature uh, and the description so I'll get the description from here and uh, the city uh, name from here and I'll get the temperature from here okay uh, so it's in Fahrenheit we can easily you know uh, transfer it or convert it into Celsius it's fine uh, so this is what I'm gonna get from this uh, API and the next step is to find a way to perform a get request to this API in inside a function in our view and then take care of the response extract the data from it and then uh, save it in our database so let's do that so if you go back to VS code inside our you can you know I'm gonna do it inside views.py you can do it uh, however you want you can add these functions but I don't want you guys to get confused in case you're using a uh, model view set before to serve your application and then you want to add this functionality to your API then you can do it within your view uh, class uh, you don't have to add extra files and other stuff so for doing a request uh, let's console or close the server we need to install a requests a package so it's pip install requests that will help us to perform requests to APIs and uh, after that inside our views.py we need to import requests I already imported here the next thing we need to do is declare a function uh, inside uh, our view set let's name it uh, for example uh, get weather data and this is going to be a private function so we'll pass self here and inside here let's declare a variable called url and this will be the url for our call and then uh, let's uh, use requests to perform a get request to this url so let's declare another variable um, let's name it api requests equal requests that we imported dot get and then we'll pass the url and then we'll uh, check if um, the request is successful then we'll return the the response data if not will return none so we'll wrap this in a try accept so here we'll say api request dot raise for status this function will tell us if the request was successful and if yes then we'll return api requests dot json if not we'll just um, return none okay none so let's add the url here i'm just gonna copy it from our request here in the postman obviously you can make this dynamic 
but for the purpose of this tutorial I'm just gonna keep it static so instead of putting this as a static here inside um, inside the URL you can just make it as a variable and then uh, the key as well and then you can use dot format to uh, insert this variable into the URL string the next thing we need to do is extract the data that we need from the API response and then save it into our database so to do that let's declare a function or a method and we'll name it save uh, data and or save weather data and this will take self as an argument and then inside this method we will say for example weather data data equals we will call the private function get weather data and then we will check if the response is not none so if weather data is not none then what we'll do we'll wrap this in a try except and then we'll create a new object of the data so we'll say weather object for example equals the we'll take the forecast model name dot objects dot create and then we'll pass the the fields or the key value of the of the fields that we have in our model so we'll start by the temperature which is equal the weather data and then if we check the response here so the temperature is within the main so it's going to be weather data main then temp okay so we'll do that main and then temp the next argument will be the description so equals with the data and let's check the response again the description is within the weather so weather is a list so we'll take the first list which is zero then we'll take description so it's going to be uh, like this weather data zero uh, then description the last argument is the city so city will will be let's check will be just the name okay so it's in the in this object it's represented by the key name so I'll just add with the data name and that should work and then after that we will save this object so with the data dot save and then we'll say accept we're not going to do anything we'll just pass okay so when we call this function what will happen or this method what will happen is this method will call the get weather data and then this method will return a response with the weather data will extract it and save it in the database the next thing we need to do is uh, to set up the scheduler so to do that first I'm going to install the AP scheduler so I'm going to use pip 
install AB scheduler. After that, I'm going to create a folder inside uh, the weather application and I'll name it a weather schedule. And inside this folder, I'm going to add a new file, which is the init file.py, which is going to allow us to see this folder as a module where we can import uh, inside our uh, files. So the other file that I need to create here, I'll name it, for example, updater or weather updater. Dot pi. Inside weather updater, I'm going to first import the background schedule from AB schedule. So I'm going to do that now. So from AB scheduler dot uh, schedulers dot background import background scheduler and then I want to use the schedule to run the save weather data inside our view set so the weather view set so I need to import that here so let me import um, from weather weather app dot views import weather view set and after that I'm going to declare a function and I'll name it you can name it whatever you want I'll name it start for example to start the the schedule so I'm going to declare this function so start and inside this function I'll first get an instant of the background schedule so I'll just say scheduler equals background scheduler and then I'll also get an instant of the weather view set so I'll just say weather uh, equals weather view set so after we initialize the scheduler here, we need to assign or add a job to the scheduler. And to do that, we can simply say scheduler uh, dot add job. And then inside here we'll specify the function that we need to execute and which is the uh, weather dot save data and then after that we'll specify the trigger for the job and the AB schedule has three types of triggers interval, a date and comment. So the interval will allow us to execute a function or execute a job in a specific interval time okay like every five minutes, every three minutes, two minutes, every 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. The date will allow us to execute this job in specific date, okay, that we specify. The corn will allow us to perform or execute the job periodically in a specific time of the day. So we're gonna go for the interval for now and I'll leave a link in the description for the documentation. You must check it out if you want to know more or get to use more functionality with a schedule. Definitely there are a lot to know there and it's pretty interesting. So let's choose the interval. 
and then after that we need to specify the interval value so for now I, I want it to be like two minutes so we'll type minutes equals two and then we need to give this uh, job an ID so we'll just say ID equal for example uh, weather 001 and then one more thing we need to add to prevent uh, the schedule from creating a copy uh, of the job each time the application restarts we can simply add replace existing true so that's for adding the job after that we can simply say schedule dot start to start the schedule so this is the main setup okay for the schedule and now that we configured the scheduler we need to call the start function when the application runs in order to get the schedule to start so in order to do that we will go to the apps.py inside our application and inside the weather class we need to or the weather config class we need to declare a method called ready and this method will get called when the application is running and ready so inside here we need to first uh, import the weather updater so what we need to do is we need to say from weather scheduler import weather updater and then we can call the start function so weather updater dot start and I'm gonna add a print statement here just to show you guys when it's getting called so I'm gonna say print and then here I'm just gonna say uh, for example launching or starting scheduler okay so this will run uh, or will get called when the application runs and is ready so the start function inside the weather updater will get called and that will start our scheduler okay let's run the server and see how it's gonna go so I'm gonna just type here python manage dot pi run server or oh, before that I just want to just to see when we get the response from the API so I'm gonna get add a print statement inside our views as well so here I'm going to print the weather data we will see it in the terminal when we get uh, weather data and yeah that that should be okay and inside the weather updater I think I'm gonna put this into one minute just to make it faster and save it and now we can run the server and it's telling me the no module name weather scheduler so okay let's just go to the apps.py just add a dot here to tell it is to get it from the root directory okay I have another error here that says background schedule oh okay I misspelled this so it's background and here as well okay now that the server is running we should get uh, a response from the weather API um, 
within the interval that we set here in our scheduler and then after that response uh, get received the the function inside views.py should extract the data from it and then save it in our database and after that we should perform uh, a get request to the endpoint uh, of our application and be able to see some objects as a response so as you see guys here we got a response back from the API and this response has uh, the data that we wanted so let's perform a get request and see if the data got saved and we see that we have no data so let's check why so I'm gonna close the server and go back to views.py and see if I did extract the data correctly so this main temperature so it's main temperature and then the second argument is description which is weather data oh okay I think I made a mistake here because it's weather data weather then the description so I need to add this here okay so I'm gonna add this here save it and then rerun the server one thing guys we need to note here as you see I have starting schedule starting schedule twice and we need to avoid that and the reason why that's happening because when we run the server again it it creates another instant of our um, application or project so in order to avoid that we need to we need to add the no reload after uh, run server so that should do it so now we should see only one starting scheduler and then we will wait until we get the response from the API and see if the data gets saved and here we go guys we got our first response from uh, the weather API and now let's check if the data uh, was saved so I'm going to perform a get request to the link and as you see here we have our first object saved so that's cool let's wait for another response and see if another object will get saved and I chose to save or create an object every time we receive a new response we can also um, update the existing object or the existing um, uh, table in our database as well so this is up to you guys so I received another response here so I'm gonna send another request and as you see guys I have two objects now so it's pretty cool that we managed to do this in the background without having to call this function every time uh, we needed to update our weather data in our database and there are many use cases for this and I re highly recommend guys that you check the documentation I'm gonna leave a link in the description for that uh, so you can uh, learn more about schedule hello everyone in this tutorial we are going to deploy our Django REST framework to one of the platforms that's very popular and easy to use which is Heroku and to do that we need to do some configurations and add some files to our projects so without further ado let's start so first thing first let's start a new terminal and activate our virtual environment 
and because the virtual environment folder is in the parent folder of uh, our uh, project folder so I'm gonna just go back and then activate it from here scripts activate and then after that I'm just gonna go back to our project folder which is my API and inside here uh, I need to initiate get because we are going to use get to deploy our project to Heroku. So to do that, we just need to say o type get init. And that will initialize an empty git repository in this folder. After that, we need to create a file inside our project folder and I'll name it dot git ignore and um, inside here we need to specify the folders and files that we want git to ignore when deploying to Heroku. So to do that we need to add first the visual of OVS code uh, folder here so we just need to type dot VS code and underneath uh, also we need to ignore the uh, database, the SQLite database. So we can just simply say start uh, SQLite. And what else we need to ignore? Uh, we need to ignore some of the files inside each application we created, like uh, the PYC. Uh, files so we need to add this one here as well dot uh, pyc and I think that's that's enough if you have your um, virtual environment folder inside your project folder then you need to add it here so I think that's enough for git ignore now we can add the project files to uh, and folders to get so we just need to say get add and dot to add all and then we're gonna do our first commit so get commit and then we can name it first commit that's fine and that will add all the folders and, and files to the, the to get after that, we need to uh, hide our secret key because if you look here, it's it's not recommended or it's risky to deploy uh, your project with an exposed uh, secret key as, as you see here. It's just a plain text. So what we need to do is we need to use a library called Python decouple to hide the secret key and some maybe it's not only the secret key if you have like an email password uh, if you have um, you're using AWS to store your files you need to hide your key AWS key and password all that you can use with the Python decouple so to do that let's first install Python decouple and we can use pip for that so pip install Python dash decouple. So I already installed it. You guys uh, can install it. And to use Python decouple, we can simply uh, before we import it, Python decouple uses a file called dot env. So we need to create this file here dot env. Inside this file here, we need to store our keys or passwords. So I'm just going to copy this from here or maybe cut it from here because we don't need it inside our settings.py anymore. So I'm going to paste it here. So here I have the secret key and I have the debug. I'm going to save this inside this file and go back to settings. Inside settings, 
I need to import config. So from decouple import config. And I'm going to use config to get the secret key. So I can basically type secret key equals config and then pass the secret key as a key. So I'll just type here secret key. Okay. And same, same thing goes for, for debug. So I can just type debug equals config and I can either bust as a key only or I can give it uh, let me type type it first also I can give it a default value so I can just say for example default equals uh, false and then I can give it another argument which is cast equals pool so it's a boolean so that's for the secret key and debug okay so now we know that the secret key for our project is protected the other thing we need to configure or change is the database URL at the moment in the development environment or in our uh, local host we're using SQLite okay and it's within our directory so we need to uh, configure that for it to work on Heroku or on online on other servers so to do that we need to use a library called Django database URL so let, let's install it first pip install Django database URL after we install Django database URL we need to use it inside our settings.py so let's import it first so from Django database URL import parse okay so we need to use parse to point out the URL for the database at the moment the database is pointing to uh, the main directory here and to the db.sqlite uh, database here file so what we need to do we need to comment this out like this and then in and after that uh, we need to create something called default URL okay so default database URL so to do that let's say default uh, DB URL equals and this will uh, will add first the SQLite so we'll just type SQLite and then after that we're, we're just here building the URL for, for the database so we need a plus sign and then we're gonna add the directory of our project so it's os.path dot join and then inside here we can use the base directory which is base dir and then the name of the database okay which is db dot sqlite okay three so if you look here this is the base directory okay which points to the directory of our project so after we create the default uh, database URL we need to um, add we need to add the database 
uh, variable so we simply type database equals and this will be an object and this object has a key default and the value will be the config if we storing our database in our or in the env file here so let's add it just in case you guys want to store it in future so we can simply say config parentheses in type database url here you <coughs> url sorry and we need to give it a default value which is the default URL or default database URL and then we can give it a cast of uh, yeah we can choose the cast to be the parse okay that's it that's all you need to configure your database so let's save this and after configuring the database we need to handle the static files and to do that we need to use a library called Django static okay so let's install this library pip install Django static okay so after installing Django static we need to go to the WSGI file here and then inside the WSGI file we need to import from uh, let's type it first from Django static import um, cling okay we need to use cling we need to wrap our application or WSGI application application um, with cling so we can add it here and that will handle static uh, files for us one more thing we need to add for the static files to work is to go to settings and add a static root okay so at the moment we have a static URL we need to add static root and this equal to uh, we need to specify the directory of the static files so what can we can do is os.path sorry it's capital letter os.path dot join and then inside here we use the base directory and then the name of the folder will be static files okay so that should do it so let's save this now and then the next step is to create uh, requirements uh, txt file okay and inside the requirements the txt file will store all the libraries that we used in our project so in when Heroku looks at uh, at our folder or our project and look for the requirements the txt file in order to know what packages and libraries needs to be installed and to do that first we need to create uh, requirements uh, dash dev txt file and that will include uh, all the packages that we needed for uh, for development so let's simply type uh, pip freeze and then we write the name of the file which is requirements dash dev dot txt and as you see here that generated requirements to dev txt and if we open it we can see all the 
uh, packages that we used in our project. So the next step is to create another file and uh, name it requirements txt so the server will look at this file not at this file this file is for our development environment and this file is where Heroku will look for this file requirements.txt so in, inside requirements.txt we need to add the server that we're going to use or Heroku will use which is a G unicorn okay so why we separated them we separated them because we don't want to add the G unicorn server which is going to be used only by Heroku to our requir requirements to dev uh, file uh, because it's this requirements to dev is for development and we don't need the G unicorn here so that's why we created another file and inside here we're going to implement all the requirements uh, dash dev uh, content plus the G unicorn so in order to do that we're going to type here dash r to read the requirements dash dev content okay and underneath we need to add the uh, G unicorn okay so I'm going to add that underneath okay also here we can add the packages and maybe dependencies that also uh, needed in the deployment stage okay so let's save this the next thing we need to do is create a proc file inside our project folder and please make sure it's a capital P okay and inside the proc file we need to specify the web server which is the G unicorn and um, add the name of our project to it so we'll simply say web and we'll add g unicorn and after that we'll add the name or the directory directory for our wsgi uh, folder which is my api dot wsgi in your case if you're creating another project uh, i mean another api uh, uh, name you need to replace this my API with the name of your main project okay uh, and after that we need to add the log file and space dash okay so let's save this uh, for the proc file after that we need to create another file called runtime and inside this file we will specify the version of Python that we are using so at the moment we're using Python 3.7 so we can specify here the version of Python by typing Python uh, dash 3.7.10 uh, and the reason why I used 3.7.10 because there are uh, specific uh, releases of Python that are supported uh, on Heroku so to verify that or to know what um, what is supported you can simply go to the website their website and then if you go to Heroku Python support you can see that uh, the versions or the releases uh, of uh, Python uh, that are supported by Heroku so you, you can see here you have a 2.7.18, 3.6, 13, 7, 10, 8, 8 and 9, 2 
also it depends on what do you use you can simply change um, the Python version inside your runtime file okay the next thing after we created all these folders files and change the configuration we need to go to Heroku and create an application there so I'm gonna go to Heroku you can if you don't have an account you can create an account it's free and then after you create an account you'll find yourself inside this dashboard where you can add new or create new project so I'm gonna go here for new create a new app and we have to give it a name so you can name it anything you want I'm just gonna name it Django dash test uh, uh, dash API okay and I can see it's available I can simply go create an app and as you see here the app was created for me and inside deploy we have to go to deploy inside deploy I can specify the way I want to deploy uh, my application or my project to Heroku one of them is through git and that will require uh, a Heroku CLI to be installed the other way is using github or using containers so in, in this example we're using git for simplicity and for that we need to install or download Heroku CLI so you can just simply cl click on Heroku CLI uh, choose your it depends on your operating system if you're using Windows Mac OS or Linux install the Heroku CLI and then simply after that we can use it inside our project so I'm gonna go back here to my app and before start starting or before we could use Heroku CLI we need to log in okay using Heroku login so I'm going to copy this and go to the terminal inside here I'll just need to clear this and then type Heroku login and it'll ask me to open this in the browser so press enter it opens in the browser and inside here I can log in so I've already logged in before that's why it says logged in for you guys if it's your first time it's going to ask you for your email and password you enter them and log in after that you close the browser and you find yourself logged in here okay after that let's go back to our application and you can see that there are some instructions here on how to use git to push or to deploy your project so first git init which we already did so after that we need to uh, use Heroku CLI to get access to the app repository so let's copy this line here go to the terminal we already did get in it we already initialized it but if you didn't you should do it and then we can type Heroku get remote and if you notice here this is the API the app name that we created on Heroku we press enter and wait for it to finish after that we need to add all the files then commit then we can push um, our project to the Heroku master branch okay so to do that first I'm going to type get add dot to add all the files that we have and then get commit and then let's name this first deploy 
and then enter. After that, we need to um, disable uh, the collect static, and that's sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. But from my experience, it's better if you disable it and do it manually because sometimes it gives error on first deploy. So to do that, I'm just gonna type Heroku config and I want to set disable collect statics equals one. So I'm gonna do that disable collect static equals one. Okay. After doing this, now I need to push um, my project to Roco uh, repository. So what I need to do is if I go here, look, I can use the git push Heroku master and then as you see here it's pushing my it pushed my my project to Heroku and now it's installing the packages uh, that I have for my project And as you see, guys, it says deployed to Heroku and then verifying deploy done. So the next step or the next thing I need to do is run the migrate to create all the necessary tables on Heroku database. So to do that, I'm just going to type Heroku. Okay, small letter. Heroku. Roco run python manage dot pi migrate and now the migrate will start and as you notice any any uh, command that I need to run on on the server or Heroku server for my project it needs to start with Heroku. So I can see here, I got an error. It says, please supply engine value, check settings documentation for more details. So I think I have some, oh, I did some mistakes here configuring the database. So let's check here if everything is all right. So I think I changed the, uh, instead of using using pass, I changed it to, uh, I create an alias, which is DP URL. And I added, I think a comma here to make it, make sure everything is all right. Saved it and then let's try again just any change you need if you want to deploy you need to add and then commit again and then deploy or let's say push so I'm gonna push the files again 
to Heroku and then I'm going to try to run the migration. So I'll wait for it to finish. I can see deployed to Heroku. Now, after it says verifying done, then I'm going to try to run the migrate again. So I'm just going to run the migrate now. And wait for it to connect. And as you see now, it's running the migrate. So it's building all the database with the tables as we configured or programmed. And as the migrate is done, now I can create a super user on the server or on Heroku by simply typing Heroku run python manage dot pi create super user okay so i'm going to choose a name for it and a password and then we're going to go to heroku try to access um, everything from the browser okay so everything should be online um, okay, let me type the name, let's say admin, email admin at myapi.com, for example, and I'll choose a password and confirm the password. And super user created successfully. One more thing we need to add before we uh, access our project or our API online is we need to add the new domain to allowed hosts. So to do that I'm just gonna go to the Heroku app and inside here if I go to settings This is this will be my domain, okay? If I click it, if I click this domain now, I try to access it. It'll tell me that invalid HTTP host header because this is not included in the allowed hosts. So I'm going to copy this and go to settings and add this to the allowed hosts list. So I'm going to paste it here save and then I'm just gonna uh, push again our files to the server I can commit and I can give this commit a name says uh, update uh, allowed hosts and then I can perform push to Heroku and after that I should be able to access the API and then get to the admin panel. So now that the deploy is done I need to go here and refresh this page and as you see I have access to my API. Okay, so if I want to go to the admin panel, just type admin. And as you see here, my API is running online. I have the login for the admin, so I'm going to type admin and then the password. And 
and as you see now I have access to all the tables and models that I already uh, have in my project and I can edit them I can uh, add new data remove data delete data I can do whatever I could do in my uh, local host so as you see guys we managed to deploy our API in just few steps and it was easy and was like kind of straightforward uh, because Heroku is is one of the easiest ways to to deploy and test your uh, projects and there are many many settings and configurations that you can use with Heroku and I highly recommend that you go through them and read the documentations and learn more about it because it's very um, very handy and and simple and easy to use so that's it guys for this tutorial I hope it was useful if you have any questions or if you have any issues with deploying to Heroku just leave uh, your question in the comments and and I'll help you with that hello everyone in this tutorial we will deploy our Django REST framework API project to AWS or Amazon web service and in order to do that I created a copy of our project I moved it into a new folder and I opened it in uh, VS code the only thing I kept is the get ignore file which includes the files and folders that we need to ignore not push to the uh, server and the requirements to txt which includes all dependencies and libraries uh, that our project requires the next step is to create a virtual environment so I'm gonna open the terminal and inside the terminal I'm gonna type a virtual env and I'm gonna name the virtual environment eb-vert we're naming it like this uh, because we are using AWS Elastic Beanstalk and eb stands for that you can name the virtual environment anything but just to refer to Elastic Beanstalk we need to name it this way and then I'm gonna execute this I'm gonna wait for uh, the virtual environment creation process and then after that I'm gonna install all the dependencies that's or that are inside the requirements.txt and then we run the server make sure everything is running or working fine after that we proceed with the elastic bean stock configurations for uh, Django REST framework project so now, now that the, the virtual environment is created uh, let me activate it by dot forward slash uh, ab dash vert forward slash scripts then activate and now that's the virtual environment is activated I can install all the dependencies by typing pip install dash r then requirements txt So it's complaining about one library called handslap which I think we don't need I'm gonna delete this library from here save and then perform the pip install again
And now that all dependencies are installed, let's run the server and see if we're missing any uh, step or if there's anything is not working. So I'm just going to type python manage dot py run server. And it's telling me the decouple module not found. So I have to install this library. Uh, so it's pip install. Uh, I think the name is python decouple. Okay, that's installed. Let's run the server again. And the Django database URL is not installed, so let's install it. Uh, URL. And it's installed. And now it's telling me that the symbol JWT is not installed, so we have to install it. Uh, pep install. Uh, I think it's Django REST framework dash symbol JWT. Hope I'm right. Okay, that's installed. Let's run the server and see if there's anything else wrong. Okay, it seems that I have a problem with my ABI WSG application, so let's take a look. Oh, okay, it's the Django statics, so I need to install that as well. So pip install. Django statics or static and now everything should work fine okay now my server Django server is working so now that I know I uh, messed a few libraries that I had inst to install later let me add this to the requirements to txt by typing pip freeze and then requirements to txt and that's added so now i'm going to run my server again Okay, so now that the server is running, we know our project is working 100%. So the next step is to configure our Django REST framework project for Elastic Beanstalk deployment. And in order to achieve that, first thing first, we need to have an AWS account. So if you don't have an account or you're not signed up with AWS, I suggest you go and to the AWS website and sign up and then you can follow up with me. I already have an account, so I'm just going to sign in. And now that I'm in um, the AWS website, so I need to go to services and either look here for Elastic Beanstalk like this, or if you already used it before, it's going to show on the recent services. Okay. So after going to Elastic Beanstalk console, You'll see this dashboard here is where we can monitor and configure our deployed project. But before we get to this stage, 
we need to deploy and create an environment for our project uh, on Elastic Beanstalk service. So in order to do that, there's a few requirements. So I'm going to go to the documentation of AWS uh, for deploying Django application with Elastic Beanstalk. So as you see here, in the deploying a Django application to Elastic Beanstalk, if you look at the requirements, we need a Python 3.6 or later, which we have. We need pip, virtual environment, and AWS CLI. So we already have most of the requirements. We just need to install AWS EP CLI, which is AWS Elastic Bean CLIs. So if we go to uh, their guide for installing it, we can see it's pretty simple to install it. So we just need to use pip install AWS EB CLI. And if we go to our um, project, so let's install it first inside our virtual environment. And then we can deactivate our virtual environment and install it globally. Okay, so I'm going to run pip install AWS CLI. And now that this done, uh, we need to go back to the documentation. And if you go step by step here with the documentation, you will see let's most of these steps we've done already, like creating a virtual environment, activating it, uh, installing Django, creating a Django project, um, and also uh, starting a project and running the server, making sure everything works fine. We already have all that, so we're going to skip to the configure your project application for Elastic Pin stock. And for that, we first need to activate our virtual environment, then create the requirements or add all the dependencies to requirements.txt, which we already did. And then we're going to start here from the step number three, which is creating an EB extensions folder. So let's do that now. And as you see now, I have an EB extensions folder. Inside this EB extension folder, we need to create a Django configuration file, which is Django config, and add some configurations to it. So I'm going to create a new file here, name it Django config, and I'm going to copy the configurations from here. To this file and if you notice this configuration is just telling the AWS Elastic Bean uh, stock where is our applications um, uh, WSGI path okay so we are gonna change this name to our project name which is my API so I'm gonna type my API here and that's all after that if we go back to the documentations, the next step is to deactivate our virtual environment and then initialize the Elastic Beanstalk uh, CLI. So to create an environment and deploy our Django REST framework project or application to Elastic Beanstalk and on AWS, we need to first initialize the EB CLI. Okay, so let's copy this comment here and then go to the terminal and 
pasted here in the terminal. And this uh, comment here will initialize the EB CLI and create a new project for us. So in this comment, we get to choose the name of the project. So I'm going to name it my API. Okay. And then we get to choose the version of Python that we need to use. And I'm going to use the Python 3.7. And I'm going to hit enter. And now this application uh, was created. Let's go back to the documentation and see the next step. The next step is optional, uh, which is EB init or initiate. And with this, I can set up an um, SSH if I want. But in this case, now for the purpose of this tutorial, I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to skip this step. The next step is to create an environment and deploy the application to Elastic Beanstack. So to do that, we need to copy this comment here and then execute it inside our uh, terminal. But let's change the name of our environment to my API dash env. Okay. And then hit enter. And now, as you see, AWS uh, or Elastic Beanstalk service is creating our application. And now that the process of creating the environment and deploying is done, we can see that create environment operation is complete, but with errors. So in order to know, and also you could know from this here summary, it says successful zero failed one. So the deployment has failed. In order to know why, the only way is to go to your console in the AWS uh, website and then refresh. And as you see here, inside environments, you have my ABI environment. So if you click on my ABI env, as you see here, the health is pending and you can see here, you have some errors, the events of uh, environment creation. So to know what caused this error, we need to go to the logs here under my ABI env to request logs. We can ask for fault logs or we can just request the last hundred lines and see if that helps at the beginning. So we download it. And as you see here, it was first installing or downloading the dependencies and the occur or the error occurred during execution of a command. So if we follow here, uh, we could see that 
this library, which is um, the database library, is causing this issue. So what we need to do is we need to exclude this one from uh, our requirements to txt and test. Bigfig is required to build this. So this is all for Postgres database. So to solve this for now, we need to go to our project requirements to txt and then exclude it because we're not using Postgres database at the moment. So I'm just going to comment this out, save. And let me check if anything else here might cause a problem on the AWS server. And I can see there are two dependencies here that might cause problem. The PyPy when 32 and the PyWin32. These two, rep two libraries are not uh, required for AWS deployment because we are using or AWS is using Linux as its uh, operating systems as we see here in a moment. So it's running on Linux. So these two libraries also might cause problems so I need to comment them out and then now I need to save this uh, changes and then try creating a new environment. I can't create the same environment name so I'm going to change it to my API dash env dash one and then execute. And now we just need to wait for AWS or Elastic Beanstalk to create the new environment for us. And now, as you see, instance deployment completed successfully and, and successfully launched environment myabi-env-1. So now I need to go to my console and then refresh. Let me choose the environment that I want. And as you see here, this is the previous environment, uh, which is failed. And we can now terminate this environment because it has failed and we don't want to keep it. So here I need to type the name of the environment, which is my API dash env and then terminate. I'll leave it to terminate and I'll go to the working environment which is my API env1 and as you see health is okay and I have no errors here and if I go to the link this is the link for my project after deployment so if I click on it I can see that my project is working and it has been deployed successfully. The only problem here is that I didn't add uh, this domain to the allowed host in, in my project. So I'm going to do that. Do that. There's, or there are two ways to do that. Either I copy this from here and add it to allowed hosts, or I can go to my project terminal and just write eb status. that will give me the status of my project and copy the C name from here and then go to settings.py inside our project and then allowed hosts and then edit here. So now how to upload or deploy my project again after the changes that I've done 
is pretty simple. We just need to type EB deploy. But before that, I want to check the git ignore file here to make sure I add it. Uh, and you guys mustn't forget this. You have to include here your virtual environment folder because you don't need to push the virtual environment folder to uh, to AWS. So I'm just going to add it here. Save git ignore and then deploy. So I'm going to ex execute the EB deploy. One thing to notice here that every time I deploy um, my project, it creates a new application or a new version of my application. So if I do some mistakes or if it happens that I deployed a version with a problem, I can always go back to the previous version and um, activate the previous application. Now we're going to wait for it to upload. And it's saying here invalid parameters value error. So it's saying no environment found for environment name. And it's good that this happened. So when I created this environment, you remember my ABI inv has failed and we had to create a new one called my API env-1 but now when I did the deploy again uh, it used the old environment so how to change that to change that we need to go to this folder here elastic beanstalk and inside here there is a config.yaml file and if you look here it the variable here, which environment, has a value which is my API dash env, which is the old environment. So we need to change that to dash one and save it. Also, from this uh, configuration files here, you can change your Python version, you can change your region where you are, and uh, then deploy. And after changing the environment name, I need to check the status to get the C name so I can add it to a loud host. So I'm just going to type AP status. And I'll take the C name from here. Copy it. And then go to settings.py and change this and save it after that I can run the deploy and now it's going to create a new version of my application with the new configurations And now that the environment has been updated successfully, let's go to the AWS, close this, close this, and refresh to see if everything is working fine and I have no errors. And now that I have no errors, let me just go to this link. And as you see now, my API has been deployed successfully and I could see all the links there and if I go to the admin 
I can see now my admin login is available. And in order to do the migrations and create a super user, we need to do that on the local host. Here, for example, we need to first activate our virtual environment, which is eb vert slash script slash activate. And then after that, we can run python manage dot pi make migrations. And then migrate. And then after that, we can create a super user. So Python manage dot pi create super user. And we'll name it admin. This username is already taken, so um, I guess because I copied the uh, database SQLite from the original folder, so it's still saved. So let me try to port this process and then uh, log in in the website or in the API. So if I can type here admin and then the password. And as you see, I'm logged in, okay? And I can control my API, I can do whatever I want, and it's all deployed to AWS. But if you didn't have the admin or the super user created, you can simply create it on the local host and then deploy again to AWS and you will be able to access your admin panel from there. Some important things to note uh, when using AWS services. First, AWS charges you for using instance or for the instance uh, that your project uses on their platform, like the EC2, the uh, load balancer and um, other services. So if you're using uh, or you're testing, you're deploying to AWS to test only, make sure after you finish testing, uh, make sure you terminate your environment. Don't just keep keep it running and forget about it because you will come after one or two, three months that, and you will find that you have like a hundred dollars bill or two hundred dollars bill and you don't need that. Another thing is if you want to use it and you uh, you decided that yeah you're going to use Elastic Beans, Stack, Stack, or you want to use other AWS services. Make sure you are familiar with Cost uh, uh, Explorer that they have. Okay, and if you go to their services and you check, they have AWS Cost Explorer, which will give you all the information you need to know about how much money uh, your project uh, is is costing you or you 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 deploy or is is consuming uh, from uh, uh, AWS resources okay and then you can adjust uh, your costs and you can ask uh, or configure AWS to give you notification when your cost exceeds certain limits so you can keep your resources under control or you can turn them off, turn them on uh, in or during specific periods. So that's very important to note. Uh, the other thing is if also you work with Elastic Beanstalk, uh, let's say you you did some changes to your projects and and then you deployed and then after deploying you found out that there's a big problem in your project and things went wrong, you can simply go to applications and then 
and choose you your application name which is for example my API and then if you come here to application versions you can see all the versions that you've deployed and you can simply uh, choose which one you want active okay for example if this is the last one you deployed and then uh, something was wrong with this version you can simply uh, activate the previous one and then fix the problems then deploy again so you will have no downtime um, also you can delete the old versions if you don't need them for example and then you can simply go to actions delete them okay you don't need these old uh, versions so you don't have uh, too much data uh, occupying your S3 bucket okay uh, you can also download your project files from here it's a zip code you just click on it and download it and you can see all your files one more thing to mention is uh, now in this stage the database that we are using is the SQLite database which is the same database that we have on our local host you can simply change that by going to your environment configurations and choose another database like uh, Postgres or MySQL or uh, any other database here by editing this field here but if it's not necessary don't do it because you will get uh, extra charges for using a database instance on AWS okay but it comes with advantages like you can always create uh, backups of your database or instance of your database so you can use it again or, or you know uh, keep it save it and also it's more secure but still if you don't need it in your use case don't use it because it'll add extra cost to your uh, project so these are the main notes that I wanted to share with you guys I hope I gave you enough information to uh, start with and if you have any question please leave them in the comment and I'll be happy to help